It was the summer of 82, and I found myself back on my ancestral lands. My name's Elias Redfeather, born and raised on the reservation in Oklahoma. Since I was a kid, I always felt, well, different. Drawn to the stories of the old ones, stories about strange creatures and spirits that roamed the land long before our people came. Now, here I was, all grown up, trying to make sense of it all. The government had sent me to document a remote part of Sequoia National Park in California. Rare plants, animal sightings, stuff for their reports. Most guys would hate the assignment, but I figured it'd be punching a clock in some stuffy office. The first few days were peaceful. Birds chirping, sun shining, the sweet smell of pine in the air. The kind of stuff you can't get back in the city. Then things went wrong. I woke up one morning to an uneasy feeling. Not scared, exactly, but like a prickle on the back of my neck, the kind you'd get when you're being watched. That afternoon I found it. A half-eaten deer carcass, but not like any predator kill I'd seen. It was practically shredded, the bones snapped like matchsticks. There were tracks too, huge and misshapen, not matching any bear or mountain lion I knew. A chill ran down my spine. This was the work of something else, something the old one's stories warned about. Night fell, and I decided to set up a camera trap, hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever lurked in those woods. As I worked, my headlamp flickered, and shapes seemed to move at the edge of the light. I turned, my heart pounding, but saw nothing. My mind was playing tricks, or maybe my ancestors were warning me. Days turned into a blur. I kept finding mauled carcasses, the tracks always nearby. My reports to the higher-ups went unanswered, figured they thought I was drunk or crazy. But I knew what I saw. One night, I finally got footage on the camera trap, a hulking figure, its eyes gleaming red in the darkness. I couldn't make out details, but it was big. Too big to be human. The creature started stalking me. I'd feel its eyes on me from the shadows, hear grunts and growls behind me. Then it got bolder. It would leave gifts. Half-gnawed animal skulls, strange symbols etched into tree bark, always right outside my tent. Things came to a head one moonless night. I was following a fresh set of tracks when my foot caught in a loop of vine. A rope snapped taut, and I was hoisted upside down my head swaying just inches from the ground. My rifle clattered to the dirt, useless. Then it lumbered out of the darkness. The creature was monstrous. It stood taller than any man, its body a gnarled mess of muscle and bark-like skin. Its eyes burned with a malevolent intelligence. It reached towards me, its claws like rusted knives. I struggled, yelling, trying to grab my fallen gun, but it was too far. The monster had me, and there was no escape. The creature lunged forward, a guttural roar echoing through the silent forest. That's when I heard the gunshot. The creature staggered, a bellow of rage shaking the leaves. I dropped to the ground, scrambling on hands and knees towards my rifle. Another shot rang out, and the monster thrashed wildly. Then a third. It let out a final, ear-splitting shriek, then collapsed with a thud that shook the earth. Breathless, heart-pounding a drum solo in my chest, I cautiously approached the creature, gun raised. It lay still, a dark pool of blood seeping into the dirt around it. Three men emerged from the shadows, lowering their rifles. Park rangers, responding to my distress signal after all. You okay, fella? One of the rangers asked, his voice rough with concern. I nodded, my voice barely above a whisper. It was huge. They exchanged uneasy glances. We've been tracking this thing for weeks. 
another ranger muttered. Been finding shredded livestock up and down the mountains. Never seen anything like it. They studied the monstrous corpse, their flashlights scanning its grotesque form. I shivered, not from the cold mountain air, but from a primal fear I didn't fully understand. One ranger looked up, his gaze meeting mine. You were lucky we got here when we did. He paused, then added, What the hell is that thing? I didn't answer. Deep down, I knew the answer, but the words felt like a betrayal of my ancestors and their ancient warnings. We were never meant to confront these creatures, only exist alongside them, a balance easily broken. The thing on the ground was a reminder of that, a reminder that some mysteries are better left untouched. The year was 1978, smack dab in the middle of the disco craze. I was a long way from the dance floors, though. Name's Everett Skyhawk, and I was a ranger in Wyoming's Yellowstone National Park. Don't get me wrong, I loved my job, the fresh air, the wildlife, the sense of something old and untamed in those woods. But it's true what they say, nature has its red side, too. See, Yellowstone ain't just geysers and bears. It's a big, wild place, with parts where a man can vanish without a trace. We'd get reports, hikers disappearing, campers' tents ripped open, animal carcasses with, well, let's just say unnatural injuries. Most folks wrote it off as bears, but I knew better. There was something else out there. That summer, the disappearances worsened. It started with a couple of campers on the park's edge, an older husband and wife. Their campsite was torn to shreds, sleeping bags shredded, but no blood. Just vanished into thin air. Then came Gary, a fellow ranger. We went way back, tough guy, knew the woods like the back of his hand. Last I saw of him, he was heading out on his regular patrol, rifle slung over his shoulder never came back. I volunteered for the search and rescue. We scoured the woods for days, finding nothing but eerie silence. That's when I knew something was seriously wrong. One foggy morning, I was hiking a remote trail when I saw it, a movement in the trees. I froze, my heart pounding in my chest. Between the shadows and the mist, it was almost impossible to make out its form but it was big, hulking, and moving with unnatural speed. My ranger training kicked in. I drew my pistol, keeping it low. My finger trembled on the trigger. I followed, cautious, every sense on high alert. The smell hit me first, wet fur, rotting meat, something primal and foul. Branches snapped under its massive weight. Then... It stepped into a clearing. I nearly choked back a gasp. The thing was grotesque. It looked like a bear, but twisted, deformed. It stood on two legs like a man, but hunched over, its spine curved, its arms dragging along the ground. Its mottled skin was patchy, hairless in places, revealing raw, pulsing flesh. Its eyes glowed a sickly yellow, fixed on something in the distance. Whatever this creature was, it wasn't natural. I eased back, trying to find a clear escape route if it spotted me. But as I retreated, I tripped over a root, my ankle twisting with a sickening crack. I bit back a cry, knowing I'd given myself away. The creature whirled around, its lips curling back in a grotesque snarl. I scrambled to my feet, my heart hammering. It charged, a guttural roar echoing through the trees. I had two choices, run or fight. And some part of me, a fierce native spirit inherited from my ancestors, refused to run. I raised my pistol, firing off a shot to try to stop it. 
The bullet hit the beast square in the shoulder, making it stagger. But it kept coming, eyes burning with rage. I fired again and again, the reports echoing through the trees. I saw blood spatter, smelled the burnt fur, but the creature only seemed to get angrier. The distance between us closed, and I knew I'd run out of time. The beast lunged, its claws outstretched. I braced myself for the impact, when, suddenly, a gunshot rang out from behind me. The creature roared in pain, whirling around. Another shot cracked through the air, and it stumbled. A figure emerged from the trees. It was Ben, one of the park's veteran rangers, his rifle raised. Get out of here, Everett, he yelled. I didn't need telling twice. I turned and ran, my injured ankle sending jolts of pain up my leg. Behind me, I heard Ben's rifle, the creature's roars, and the crashing of the underbrush. I pushed through the pain, desperate to put distance between myself and that thing. I stumbled out of the trees into a meadow, and there, waiting, was a rescue team. They rushed towards me, their voices frantic. I turned back towards the tree lean. Ben! I gasped. He saved me, but... They exchanged worried glances. One of the rangers looked at me, his expression grim. Ben's been dead for two weeks, Everett. Went missing on patrol. The medics patched me up as best they could back at base camp. Shock and exhaustion washed over me in waves, mingling with the searing pain of my injury. They tried asking questions, what happened, what I saw, but I could only offer fragments. The creature, Ben, none of it made sense. The next few days were a blur. Investigations, whispers of animal attack, folks looking at me with a mix of pity and suspicion. The higher-ups, sensing a PR nightmare, hushed everything up. Gary's and the camper's disappearances were explained away, Ben's death written off as some tragic accident during the search. But I knew. I knew the truth lurking out there in those ancient woods, just beyond the reach of the boardwalks and campfire chatter. The knowledge ate at me, a chilling reminder that the wilderness held secrets beyond our understanding. My injured ankle took weeks to heal, and I was confined to desk duty. It was torture, staring at maps when I knew that monster was still out there. I started obsessively researching park records, old legends. Anything that could give me a hint about what I'd encountered. Then I found it a tattered ranger journal from the late 1800s. It described creatures matching almost exactly what I'd seen, deformed, vicious, with glowing eyes. The native tribes had a name for them, skin changers. Trickster spirits that could take animal forms but were twisted with evil. It was far-fetched, but it felt chillingly right. My search became a lonely crusade. The other rangers humored me, patting me on the back while they exchanged sidelong glances. I spent sleepless nights poring over faded texts, the scratching of my pen the only sound in my cabin. The fragments of lore I assembled painted a terrifying picture. The skin changers were said to be vengeful, driven by insatiable hunger and a hatred of humans who encroached on their domain. I knew I had to do something. I couldn't let more people die, couldn't let the truth remain buried. But how do you fight a monster straight out of a nightmare? One moonlit night, the answer came to me, a whisper of the old wisdom carried in my blood. My ancestors knew things about the balance of nature that modern science scoffed at. The skin changers weren't just flesh and blood. They had a spiritual core, and that could be their weakness. I spent the next few days gathering supplies, hiking deep into the backcountry on the pretext of maintenance work. On secluded trails, I left offerings, food, herbs, tobacco. I followed rituals passed down through generations, 
prayers meant to appease the land spirits. And in the darkest part of the night, furthest from any other human presence, I made a sacrifice. A part of myself, a testament to my desperation and resolve. The next full moon I waited, armed with only my rifle, a worn silver amulet, and a desperate prayer, I ventured to the place where I first saw the creature. The clearing seemed to throb with an unnatural stillness. The wait was excruciating. Hours passed, the only sound my own ragged breathing. Had my gamble failed? Was I just a crazy old ranger with a twisted ankle and a head full of ghost stories? Then it emerged from the shadows. The skin changer stood in the moonlight, its deformed body gleaming, its yellow eyes burning into mine. A primal surge of terror coursed through me, but beneath it, a spark of defiance. I raised the silver amulet, an ancient symbol meant to ward off evil. The creature recoiled, a hiss escaping its throat. I started chanting, words passed down from my ancestors, a plea for the spirits of that land to protect their own. The skin changer snarled and lunged, but it was hesitant. It circled me, confusion mingling with rage in its eyes. As I chanted, my conviction grew. I wasn't fighting it just with weapons, but with the belief system ingrained in my very being. The skin changer, despite its monstrous form, was vulnerable to this, a disruption in the natural order it desperately needed to cling to. With a final, guttural roar, the creature turned and melted back into the shadows. It was gone. The aftermath was messy. I never found solid proof, no photos or corpses to convince the skeptics. My reports were ridiculed, and eventually I was dismissed. Folks in town started calling me. Crazy old Everett, the ranger who talked to trees. It stung, but a part of me understood. Some truths are too wild to survive the scrutiny of modern life. The disappearances stopped. Maybe the skin changer was banished, maybe just driven deeper into hiding. But I know that somewhere, in the deepest heart of Yellowstone, the balance is still maintained not by park regulations or search-and-rescue teams, but by old knowledge, by the uneasy truce between man and the mysteries that endure long after we're gone. I carry the scars the twisted ankle, the whispers behind my back, and the weight of a gruesome secret. But in those quiet moments, when the wind rustles through the pines, I think I hear a whisper of thanks from the ancient spirits of that place. And that, for me is enough. The year was 1995. I found myself deep in the tangled wilderness of the Florida Everglades. Folks think it's all swamps and gators, but there's parts so dense the sunlight barely reaches the ground. I'm Dakota Redstone, born and raised in the Seminole Nation. This land is in my blood. I worked as a wildlife conservation officer, a good fit for a nature lover like me. But lately, there was something off about the place, something that sent shivers down my spine. It started with the reports coming in from deep in glades, livestock disappearing one by one, leaving ripped-up fences and trails of blood. Word got around quick among the ranchers. They were blaming it all on the usual suspects' panthers or gators gone rogue. But I spent my whole life out here, and I knew this was something else. Then there were the disappearances. First an old hermit living off-grid. His cabin found abandoned, splattered with blood. Next, a pair of hikers seasoned folks who knew these woods like the backs of their hands. Search parties found nothing but a ripped backpack and a chilling silence. The higher-ups told me to let the sheriff's department handle it, to stick to my animal rescues. 
But the Seminole and me knew we owe a duty to the land, not just the creatures with feathers or fur. One moonless night, I set out into the swamp alone, following the rumors and the whispers in my blood. My flashlight cut a weak path into the thick, steamy darkness. The air hung heavy with the smell of decay and something, old. That's when I heard it, a rustling in the bushes, too heavy to be any animal I was used to. I froze, my heart pounding. Then the creature stepped into the weak circle of light. My breath caught in my throat. It was like a man, but twisted and wrong. Its body was a gnarled mass of branches and knotted roots, like something that crawled out of the swamp itself. Its face was a mask of bark and leaves, and its eyes, they burned with a sickly green light. My rifle felt like a child's toy in my trembling hands. The creature lunged with impossible speed. I fired, more out of instinct than hope. The shot echoed through the swamp, but the creature barely flinched. It knocked me off my feet, my rifle flying from my grasp. I scrambled back scrabbling for my knife. The smell of rot filled my nostrils. It raised a clawed hand, branches dripping with black slime reaching for my throat. I closed my eyes, bracing for the end. Then a gunshot shattered the thick air. The creature roared, a primal sound that shook the trees. Get up, kid! A gruff voice barked. I snapped my eyes open. An older figure stood in the darkness, shotgun raised, wisps of smoke curling from the barrel. It was old Tom Baker, a local legend, a tracker known for living months off the land. Thought you could use some help, Tom grunted, reloading his gun with practiced ease. I stumbled to my feet, my heart pounding a frantic rhythm. He nodded at the creature, which was now circling us warily its eyes glittering with a strange intelligence. Never seen anything like it, swamp demon, maybe. Together, we fired at the creature, driving it back into the shadows. It let out another enraged bellow, and then disappeared into the undergrowth with an uncanny swiftness that left us both shaken. We gotta warn folks. I choked out, a cold dread settling in my stomach. Tom shook his head. Nobody'll believe us. Think we're a couple of crazy old coots. He gave me a wry grin. Besides, they wouldn't stand a chance against that thing. For the rest of the night, we stalked through the swamp, searching for the creature's lair, but we found nothing but a trail of broken branches and an eerie silence. As dawn broke, we stumbled back to the edge of the glades, exhausted but determined. Tom clapped me on the shoulder, his eyes serious. This thing ain't natural, boy. It's part of the old magic, something we can't understand with our maps and radios. He gave a tired sigh. It's up to folks like us now, connected to the land. We gotta find a way to stop it. We parted ways, an unspoken understanding passing between us. The sheriff's department investigated the attacks, wrote them off as animal encounters, as the disappearances piled up. Tom and I became reluctant partners, meeting in secret, studying old seminal legends and tracking the creature's movements. We knew the truth, a truth nobody else would accept. Our weapons felt puny, modern tools against something ancient. My ancestors spoke of banishing spirits, of rituals tied to the cycles of the swamp itself. And in desperation, I turned to those teachings, passed down for countless generations that the modern world scoffed at. One night, under a full moon, we ventured back into that oppressive heart of the Everglades. We laid offerings at the base of the oldest cypress trees, tobacco, cornmeal, prayers whispered into the humid night. I painted symbols of protection on my skin using swamp mud and cypress sap. Tom watched, a flicker of unease in his eyes, but he didn't interfere. 
The creature emerged from the shadows, fury blazing in its eyes. Something seemed different, the air around it crackling with a dangerous energy. And then I understood. The moon, the offerings, we had given it power, unwittingly fueling the darkness that twisted it. We didn't run. To flee would be to lose, to surrender the land we were sworn to protect. Tom raised his shotgun, but I placed a hand on his arm. It was time to try a different approach, to use its own power against it. I lifted my hands, not in surrender but in a gesture from the old stories, palms out like a plea to the elements themselves. Tom, I rasped, remember what I told you about the balance? He nodded slowly, eyes locked on the creature. You think you can turn its own magic against it? Hope so, I muttered, the words catching in my throat. I closed my eyes, focusing not on the creature's monstrous form but the primal essence swirling within it. A tangled mess of stolen energy, the cries of the missing people, the swamp's own corrupted life force. I reached with my spirit, not into the darkness, but into the heart of the land itself. The roots beneath my feet, the buzzing insects, the very humidity clinging to the air, they thrummed with a desperate need for balance, for the old ways to return. The creature snarled, sensing the shift in the wind. But it was too late. The earth under our feet seemed to tremble. Vines shot up from the muck, coiling around the creature's limbs. Cypress roots groaned and shifted, the ground itself opening up to reveal grasping, skeletal hands that pulled at the monster's form. The creature thrashed, roaring in fury and confusion. Tom and I watched, weapons lowered, as the swamp itself seemed to rise up against its defiler. The creature wasn't just being attacked. It was being absorbed, consumed by the very energy it had twisted. Its green, glowing eyes dimmed, its form dissolving back into branches and slime. Finally, with one last strangled cry, it was gone. The vines retreated. The phantom hands sank back into the mud. The air hummed with an echoing silence, broken only by our ragged breaths. We stood there for a long time, either of us speaking. Eventually, the first rays of dawn painted the swamp in a pale, trembling light. Only then did Tom break the silence. Well, I'll be damned, he muttered, shaking his head. All these years, and it took a nature spirit to bring that thing down. I managed a shaky laugh. Nature spirit, I repeated, the words rolling strangely on my tongue. Maybe that's what it was, some corrupted echo of the balance this place needs. The aftermath was messy, in ways both expected and not. The disappearances stopped. The official reports blamed it on tragic accidents, wild animals, the usual cover-ups. But the ranchers started noticing their livestock was thriving, the glades themselves seemed to hum with a healthier energy. Tom and I never spoke of it again. We returned to our usual routines, but something had shifted between us. We shared a secret that strained against the boundaries of logic. In the hush of the swamp, beneath the buzzing insects and the croaking gators, I swore I sometimes heard whispers. Whispers of thanks, of the land slowly healing itself. Years rolled by. I grew older, wiser, my connection to the land, and the seminal ways deepening with each passing moon. Sometimes, alone in those wild depths, I felt a prickle on my skin, a sense of being watched. But it wasn't fear, not anymore. It was a grudging respect, a silent acknowledgement between me and the unknown forces that moved within that place. Tourists started flocking to the glades more and more, hungry for airboat rides and gator sightings. I saw the highways expand, condos creeping closer. The old tales were dismissed as ghost stories to entertain visitors. In those moments, 
a familiar dread would rise in me, a fear of another imbalance, another greed that might give rise to a new darkness. One steamy afternoon, I got a call from a young ranger, a voice frantic with a fear I recognized all too well. The disappearances had started again. I hung up, my hands shaking, and went to find Tom. He was waiting for me on his porch, shotgun by his side, lines etched deep into his weathered face. Guess it's our turn again, he said with a grim smile. And as I looked into his eyes, I realized the truth, a twist that sent a chill down my spine. We were the old ones now, the guardians of a secret the world couldn't comprehend. We were the last line of defense against the shadows that lurked just beyond the edge of progress. And deep down, I knew that as long as we stood, as long as I could draw strength from the whispers of the swamp, there would always be a balance, however tenuous and terrible. My name is Tall Feather, and I live on a small patch of the Crow Reservation in Montana. This happened to me around 1987, when I was a scrappy teenager always looking for a fight or a good time. It was a time before cell phones when most of the tribal families lived in beat-up old trailers or tiny government-issued houses. You can picture it, rolling hills, a few scattered trees, and the ever-present wind. Life on the reservation has its own rhythm, far removed from the hustle and bustle of the city. My buddy Lucas and I were inseparable. We were cousins who grew up together. He was the more cautious one, always thinking twice before following me into some crazy scheme. That August, we were itching for adventure. We spent most of our days hunting for arrowheads near the river sometimes unearthing dusty treasures, sometimes just getting sunburned. One sticky afternoon, bored with the usual spots, we decided to hike toward the distant tree line, a place we never properly explored. The sun beat down on our backs as we trekked across the dry grass. We swatted at flies and joked to pass the time. The trees seemed to get further away, not closer. We must have walked deeper into the hills than we realized. Tall feather, I don't like this. Lucas whined, swatting a mosquito away from his face. It's getting late, and Ma's gonna kill me. Chill out, man, I scoffed. We won't be gone long. Besides, you know trouble loves us. We crested another small hill, and below us was a sight that stopped us in our tracks. There, in a shallow dip in the land, was a cluster of abandoned cars, old, rusted things. There was a Chevy with its door hanging open, a Ford missing a wheel, and the skeleton of what must have been a giant pickup truck. It looked like an old junkyard had been dumped in the wilderness, the tall grass growing around and through the wrecks. What the? Lucas gasped. Come on. Let's investigate, I exclaimed. I've always been drawn to the weird, the forgotten. It's like finding a different part of the world hiding in plain sight. Lucas followed me reluctantly, the curiosity getting the better of him. As we drew closer, the stench hit us, a mix of stale gasoline, decaying upholstery, and something else I couldn't quite place. Whoa, it stinks worse than Uncle Joey after a bean supper, Lucas gagged. Quit your belly aching. Let's see what's inside these babies. The Chevy was mostly empty, save for some empty beer cans and a torn map of Wyoming. The Ford still held a tattered blanket on the seat, and the pickup was a skeleton of metal and weeds. The sun was setting, casting long shadows the sky turning an ominous shade of orange. Just as we were about to give up, I saw it, a flicker of something out of the corner of my eye, by the far end of the pickup. Luke, did you see that? I asked, goosebumps prickling my skin. Fear shot through me, 
suddenly replacing my excitement. See what? he whispered. Over there. By the truck. Something moved, I said, my voice shaking. He squinted toward the pickup, the sun behind him. I don't see anything, man. You're freaking me out. My heart hammered like it was trying to break free of my ribs. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched. Every hair on my arms was standing on end. Then, a flash of movement again, this time closer, like someone ducking behind the skeletal truck. I'm serious. Something's here, I insisted, stepping away from the rusted vehicles. I edged toward the truck, my eyes scanning the shadows beneath it. Tall feather, come on. Let's just go, Lucas pleaded. I ignored him. Slowly, I circled the truck, nerves stretched tight. Just as I rounded the back, a shape exploded from beneath the vehicle. It was huge, a hulking, hunched figure covered in coarse dark hair. It moved faster than anything I'd ever seen, a blur of muscle and fury. Lucas shrieked as the thing lunged at him, its claws outstretched. It struck his shoulder, and a spray of blood filled the air as he screamed. I don't even remember what I did. It was instinct. I was yelling, throwing rocks, anything I could think of. The thing spun toward me, its eyes burning like coals, its mouth filled with rows of jagged teeth. It let out a guttural roar, a sound that seemed to shake the very ground beneath my feet. Lucas lay on the ground, clutching his wounded shoulder, blood running through his fingers. I lunged for him, dragging him away from the beast. It snarled, pacing, but it didn't attack. The sun had almost dipped below the horizon, and we were bathed in the bloody twilight. Help! I yelled, but we were miles from anywhere, and my voice felt lost in the wind. Lucas was whimpering, blood soaking his shirt. I had to do something. My eyes fell on the rusted cars. Could we get inside one? Barricade ourselves? It was a gamble, but we were already in its territory. Come on! I tugged Lucas to his feet, and we stumbled toward the nearest car. I shoved him into the passenger side of the Chevy. He slumped against the seat, gasping in pain. Blood smeared the window. I slammed the door and ran to the driver's side. The door's hinges creaked like they hadn't been used in decades. I threw myself inside and fumbled for the keys. Please, God, let the keys still be in here. My fingers brushed against cold metal and my heart nearly stopped. The engine roared to life, dust and grit flying around the inside of the car. I threw it into gear and hit the gas. The wheels spun in the dirt for a terrifying moment before catching. I swerved back toward the creature, barely missing it as it lunged. Sweat dripped into my eyes, making everything blurry. I gripped the steering wheel so hard my hands ached as we bumped and rattled up the hill away from the car graveyard. Through the back window, I could see the beast watching us, a dark, towering silhouette outlined against the bleeding sunset. Its roar sent shivers down my spine. We didn't stop until we reached the main road, where I floored the car all the way back to the reservation. We tore across the reservation roads, fear our only passenger. The car rattled and whined, but it kept moving. Lucas cried beside me, pressing his hand against his blood-soaked shirt. Terror pulsed through me, an icy wave that left me shaking and gasping for breath. When we reached the heart of the reservation, I didn't stop at his house. Instead, I drove straight to the clinic a small, concrete building that always smelled of bleach and old magazines. Dr. Morris, a weathered old Lakota man, was there, as he usually was at all hours. The moment he saw Lucas, his face tightened into a mask of concentration. He worked quickly, 
cleaning the wound, stitching the gash with a steady hand. The gashes across Lucas's shoulder weren't deep, but they were long and ugly. What the hell happened to him? Dr. Morris asked, his voice low and gravelly. An accident, I said, my voice hoarse. My mind stumbled over the words to describe what we had seen. Lucas whimpered, his face pale under the harsh clinic lights. It was a monster, he gasped. Dr. Morris glanced at me, his eyes narrowed. He knew us both. He knew we weren't prone to wild stories. Later that night, after Lucas was tucked into bed, his mother shouting at me, I went to see my grandfather. He lived in an old trailer on the outskirts of the reservation, surrounded by wind-shaped pines. His face was a map of wrinkles, a record of his years, but his eyes held the sharp wisdom of the old ones. Tell me everything, he said, his voice quiet in the dimness of his trailer. He gestured for me to sit on a worn armchair across from him. I hesitated, then spilled out the whole story, the forgotten junkyard, the creature, the attack on Lucas. He didn't interrupt, his face unreadable in the flickering light from a lantern. Finally, when my voice gave out, he spoke. That place, he said, his voice thick with memory. My father warned me away from it when I was a child. That spot has an old evil clinging to it. It is hungry. Hungry for what? I asked, fear creeping back into my heart. Who knows? Spirits that twist and change, that feed on fear perhaps, or pain. His gaze held mine. There are things in this land that walk the edge of our world, tall feather. You saw one tonight. He told me stories then about the old ones, creatures out of legends some would call Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Yet, this wasn't a gentle, forest-dwelling giant. This was raw and savage, its eyes burning with dark intent. A week passed. Lucas's wound healed, leaving a jagged scar. We stayed close to home, the image of the beast seared into our minds. We never mentioned it, except in hush whispers late at night when fear threatened to overwhelm us. Then, one afternoon, a battered police truck rolled onto the reservation, raising a cloud of dust. The policeman, Officer Wilson, a bulky man with a perpetual frown, knocked on my door. We got a call about a missing hiker, he said, his voice official and clipped. A man went missing by those hills you boys like to roam the ones with the old cars. A cold realization washed over me. Had the creature taken another victim? Did you guys see anything? The officer pressed, squinting at me in suspicion. It was no secret that Lucas and I were troublemakers. No, sir, I replied, trying to keep my face blank. My grandfather's words echoed in my ears. The world doesn't always believe in monsters, not even when they stand right before you. The man eventually left, unsatisfied. Days turned into uneasy weeks. The reservation was on edge, whispered rumors of disappearances spreading like wildfire. Men went out in search parties armed with rifles, patrolling the hills. Yet, no trace of the hiker was ever found. Then, one day, I was out wandering trying to settle my jumbled thoughts. I walked past the rusted cars, the hill where we had seen the creature. It was eerily quiet, even the birds seemed absent. As I stood on the edge of the clearing, I saw it. The creature was perched on a ridge overlooking the junkyard, its dark form silhouetted against the sky. It was watching, and I knew, without a doubt, it was waiting. It was patient, its hunger a constant, throbbing force in the quiet hills. Life on the reservation changed after that. People became more watchful. Children rarely wandered far from home. Nobody spoke of the creature, but its presence hung heavy in the air, 
an unsolved mystery that cast a shadow of fear across our lives. Years later, Lucas and I moved off the reservation, chasing different dreams. He married, had children, became a teacher, a quiet life far removed from the terrors that lingered in our youth. I got work as a hunting guide, my life spent roaming the vastness of Montana. One autumn, I led two hunters into the same wild country where I'd faced the creature. They were city men, loud and careless. They disregarded my warnings to stay together, their bravado a shield against the unknown. Then, late one evening, one of them didn't return to camp. We searched through the night, our flashlights cutting through the darkness. We found him near dawn, his body torn, a brutal echo of the attack on Lucas all those years ago. We buried him quickly in the cold earth and fled those woods. I never told them what lurked there. Some things are beyond understanding. I'm Red Hawk, and I've lived on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota my whole life. Back in 83, when I was a teenager always sniffing out trouble, me and my two friends decided to explore a patch of abandoned land north of town. There were old stories circling the reservation about that place, tales about how the government had dumped who knows what on that ground years back. My buddies were Dale Tutos, named on account of a childhood mishap with a lawnmower, and Charlie, Chugs, Yellow Bird, the only kid I knew who could down a gallon of milk in under five minutes. We called ourselves the Badlands Trio, and no adventure was too crazy. Yo, Red Hawk, bet you won't hike to that freaky land. Charlie goaded me one hot afternoon. You want to bet five bucks on that? I retorted, a grin splitting my face. Reservations aren't known for having a lot to do, so a dare was as good a way as any to pass the time. We set off the next morning armed with nothing but pocket knives and an overflowing sense of teenage invincibility. The hike took a few hours across dusty flatlands and under the relentless summer sun. When we finally hit the edge of the site, my heart pounded hard beneath my ribs. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen. Old, rust eaten cars and trucks dotted the landscape. There were cracked vats and tanks leaking green sludge into the thirsty ground. There were concrete walls that formed half-broken structures, and a tangle of pipes and wires led nowhere. Whatever this place was in its past life, it looked like a ghost town kicked over by a giant. This place gives me the shivers, Dale muttered, eyeing a cracked building with its windows knocked in. I had to agree. The whole place whispered of something gone very wrong. Hey, look at that! Charlie pointed to the furthest edge of the zone, where piles of rotting barrels were stacked against the chain-link fence. My curiosity won out over the rising sense of unease. Let's go check it out, I said, trying to sound braver than I felt. The barrels were a mess, some collapsed, others leaking a foul-smelling oily liquid. A couple were marked with faded hazard signs, skulls, and crossbones staring back at us. We were turning away when the noise started. A low growl that seemed to vibrate through the air itself. Charlie froze, his face pale. Dale took a nervous step back, bumping into a barrel. It toppled over, spilling its contents with a sickening splash. That was when I saw it. A dark shape, impossibly huge, rising out of the mess of barrels. At first, I thought it was a bear, something big and angry that we disturbed. But this creature, it moved on two legs, towering at least eight feet tall. Its body was covered in thick, dark fur, knotted and mangy, and its arms were impossibly long, ending in wickedly clawed hands. Its face... That was the worst part. It was pulled into a stretched snout filled with jagged fangs. 
Its eyes burned red, and drool dripped off the teeth as it let out another guttural growl. Run! Dale shrieked, and we didn't need to be told twice. We bolted across the junk-strewn clearing. My lungs burned, but I forced my legs to move faster. I heard thundering footsteps behind us and Charlie's scream as the creature closed in on him. I didn't dare look back. We ran until we were back on the main road, collapsing in a panting heap. Back at the reservation, nobody believed our story, of course. They said we were making it up, or that we'd inhaled some fumes to get high. Even Dale started to waver, questioning what we'd seen. But I knew— Something monstrous lurked out there, a creature bred from the poisons we humans dump into the earth. A couple of days later, on a dare from some older boys, I snuck back out to the site. There was a police car parked on the dirt track, and men in yellow suits were milling about. When I found the place by the fence, the barrels were gone, and so was any sign of a struggle. Except... Deep scratches marred the fence, and there was an odd chemical smell lingering in the air. They cleaned it up, hid the evidence of what they'd left festering. But I know better. Sometimes, if I'm out hiking and I see the distant rise where the forbidden zone lies, I swear I feel its eyes on me, red, hungry, and filled with an unnatural rage. The next time I see that thing, I won't be running. Last week, I bought myself a hunting rifle from a guy who runs a pawn shop. When the creature breaks out, as I know it will someday, I'll be ready. And when I put a bullet through its monstrous heart, maybe, just maybe, the rest of the world will finally understand the evil we've unleashed on our own land. I'm Luca Fisher, living on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. This happened back in 1996 when I was a scrappy kid constantly out searching for something interesting. That summer, me and my cousin, Jasper, had heard tales about old mines up in the hills, abandoned places where folks used to dig for silver. Sounded like the perfect spot for an adventure. It was July the desert heat thick and sticky, air shimmering off the sandstone cliffs. We filled our backpacks with water bottles, beef jerky, and flashlights. Jasper grinned, his eyes sparkling with mischief. Ready to find buried treasure, Luca? He joked. Treasure or trouble? I shot back. You know those go hand in hand. We followed a winding trail, sun beating down on our backs. After a few hours, we stumbled upon an old, weather-beaten sign half-buried in the sand. Danger! Abandoned mine shaft! My heart did a double beat. Jasper's smile widened. Now you're talking, he said and pushed past me into the cool darkness. The narrow mine shaft led into the belly of the hill, its air damp and chilling. It smelled musty, and cobwebs clung to the rock walls. Something about the silence made me uneasy. I don't like this, I mumbled, my voice echoing weirdly in the blackness. Lighten up. It's cool in here, isn't it? Jasper said, his flashlight beam bouncing erratically as he walked. I trailed behind, my heart pounding a weird tattoo against my ribs. The tunnel branched and twisted. We were deep inside the mountain now, the silence punctuated only by the drip-drip of water. Yo, Luca, check this out, Jasper called from a side tunnel. I reluctantly followed the bobbing light. The tunnel opened into a small cavern, its ceiling dripping water into a still, green pool in the center. The air here felt different, heavy and stale. Gross, Jasper said, wrinkling his nose. I was about to agree when I saw it. On the far side of the pool, there was a dark shape hunched against the cavern wall. 
What is that? I whispered. My beam of light sliced through the gloom and hid it. It was enormous, a giant bear-like thing. Its fur was patchy, and its eyes, when it turned toward the light, shone amber, full of menace. I stumbled back in sudden terror. Jasper dropped his flashlight with a curse. It rolled away, the beam flickering on and off. The creature snarled, a low rumble vibrating through my bones. Run! I yelled, but Jasper froze, staring at the hulking form. The beast lunged with surprising speed, knocking him to the ground. Jasper screamed, the sound echoing through the cavern. I turned and ran, my lungs screaming for air. I heard the crashing footsteps behind me in a blood-chilling growl, so close I could feel its hot, rotten breath on my neck. The mine entrance was a sliver of light in the distance. I ran faster than I'd ever run, stumbling and gasping. The beast was gaining on me. Its claws scraped the rocks. One swipe, and I'd be ripped to pieces. Just as I burst into the blinding sunlight, the creature roared in frustration. For a long, terrible second, I thought it would follow me out, but then it retreated into the shadows. I fell to the ground, chest heaving, my body slick with sweat and the icy touch of fear. Back at the reservation, nobody believed us when we told the story, except for my grandfather. He said there were things that walked the shadows of the desert, ancient creatures disturbed from their slumber. He warned me the mines were forbidden for a reason. A few weeks later, some hikers heading up to those same hills went missing. Search parties found their camp torn apart, but no trace of them was ever found. The story was in all the newspapers, and the warnings were even stronger. Stay away from the old mines. But whenever I'm out hiking in the desert, even in the full light of day, I feel a chill slither down my spine. I can't shake the image of the creature lurking in the darkness, its amber eyes burning, waiting. Jasper still gets nightmares about it sometimes, and I won't go within a mile of a mine shaft ever again. He says we were lucky to escape, and I know he's right. Some nights... I think back to that fetid cavern and the monstrous thing that lived in the shadows. It was like something out of an old, forgotten legend, a reminder that the world still has dark corners, places where the old tales might be true. I was born on the Wind River Reservation in the late seventies. Names Tatanka. Life back then, well, let's just say it wasn't a cakewalk. Now you might think being a kid on the res was all running wild and shirking schoolwork, but the truth is, folks worked hard. I spent summers on my grandparents' ranch, herding cattle and mending fences, trying to keep those old bones together. Learned a thing or two about the simple life, respect for the land. 1995. I was a scrawny young buck, more interested in my beat-up Camaro and the girls at the Silver Dollar Saloon. Until one night, that is. Night that changed everything. My buddy Jared and I, bored out of our minds, decided a bit of night fishing at Shoshone Lake sounded just about right. We piled into his dad's truck, a cooler full of beer and a couple poles we probably shouldn't have borrowed. Now, Shoshone Lakes always had a sort of reputation. You know, the usual old wives' tales of strange lights and disappearances. Jared, he loved that stuff. Figured he'd scare the pants off me with some ghost story once we got out there. I don't believe in ghosts. Never have. But let me tell you, as that old truck bumped along the dirt road, the moon cutting through the trees like a spotlight, it gave me the shivers anyway. We reached the lake, the water black and glassy under the night sky. Jared starts yapping about some monster folks say lives out there. 
Big oil fish with glowing eyes and razor teeth. I just rolled my eyes. We set up on a rocky outcrop, cast our lines. It was kinda nice. Quiet. Just the sound of crickets and the splash of a fish every now and then. We cracked open a couple of beers, told stupid jokes that were way funnier thanks to the booze. Then, that's when I saw it. Over on the other side of the lake, a flicker of light. Like a flashlight, but bobbing around erratically. See! Jared whispers, eyes wide. I told you there was something weird out here. I squint out at the distant shore. That's probably just some drunk kids messing around. I scoff, but my voice sounds less confident than I'd like. That light was getting closer. I could make out a shape. Looked like a boat, maybe? Too small for a proper craft, though. And it was zigzagging, moving too fast to be anyone fishing. I don't like this, Jared says. Me neither, I admit. Whatever it was, it had our full attention now. Then it stopped. Seemed to be hovering right at the edge of the trees. Another flicker of light, and then silence. The hair stood up on the back of my neck. See, on the reservation, we got stories about the trickster spirits. Old legends, sure, but stories stick with you anyway. Let's get out of here. Jared says, starting to reel in his line with shaking hands. I nod, the fishing trip suddenly forgotten. Just as we're packing up, I hear a sound. A sort of scraping, shuffling noise coming from the trees where the light disappeared. What the hell is that? Jared whimpers. I hold up a hand, trying to focus on where the noise was coming from. My grandpa taught me a few things about tracking. It was getting closer. Come on, I hiss, grabbing our stuff and heading towards the truck. Whatever was out there, I wasn't sticking around to find out. We start walking, the crunching of leaves under our boots seeming way too loud in the stillness of the night. Then, from behind us, a howl. Not a coyote or wolf howl. Nothing I'd ever heard before. It was high-pitched, almost like a scream, and it echoed off the rocks making my blood run cold. Run! Jared yells, breaking into a sprint. I didn't need telling twice. We tore through the undergrowth, branches whipping at our faces, fear propelling us towards the distant glow of the truck's headlights. Another howl, closer this time. Whatever it was... It was chasing us. A flashlight beam cuts through the trees ahead, Jared's dad's truck. I can see the outline of the open door. Salvation. We run harder, lungs burning, the sound of whatever lurks behind us growing louder with every step. Just as we reach the clearing, something huge bursts from the tree line. For a split second, I see it silhouetted against the moonlight. Tall. Unnaturally tall, and stooped over. Its arms were too long, ending in wicked-looking claws. But most of all, it was the eyes. Yellow, glowing orbs that seemed to burn right through me. I let out a yell, pure terror fueling my legs as I leap into the truck cab. Jared scrambles in behind me, slamming the door shut. The creature, if that's what it was lets out another blood-curdling howl as it reaches the edge of the clearing. But it doesn't step into the open. Go! 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 Jared shrieks. His dad, bless that man, must have heard the commotion. The engine roars to life, headlights cutting through the darkness. He tears out of there, tires spitting up gravel and dirt. I don't look back. I couldn't. All I can see are those glowing eyes burning into my mind. Jared sobbing in the seat beside me, mumbling something about demons and the end of days. I tried to tell myself it was just a trick of the light, 
a big coyote with mange or something. But deep down, I know that wasn't the case. Whatever dwells by Shoshone Lake, it ain't natural. Back in 1988, I was a hotshot kid fresh out of the academy, assigned to the Navajo Nation Police Force. Thought I'd seen it all, but nothing could have prepared me for what happened out in the canyons of Seji. Call me Wakapi, it ain't my real name, but with the kind of things I've seen, you learn to keep certain parts of yourself hidden. Now, Seji Canyon ain't a place for the faint of heart. It's a maze of red rock and twisted juniper, the kind of place where old stories cling to the shadows. Stories about skinwalkers and other things best left unsaid. Mostly, I dismiss those as tall tales, relics of an older time. Turns out, reality had a way of biting back. It started with some missing cattle. A rancher named Silas Begay reported a couple of his steers vanished in the night, right off his property on the edge of the canyon lands. Found the fence cut clean through, not a trace of blood or struggle. Now, cattle rustling ain't exactly uncommon, but something about this felt off. I questioned Silas, a weathered old Navajo with eyes that had seen a thing or two. We sat on his porch— sipping bitter coffee as he explained that this wasn't his first loss. Over the past few months, he'd been finding carcasses scattered out in the canyons, not butchered, but drained. Like all the life had been sucked right out of them. Something ain't right, Silas had said, his voice low. Something's out there, with copy. That evening, with a knot of unease in my gut, I headed out into the canyons. The sun was dipping below the horizon, painting the rock walls in shades of orange and blood red. Shadows stretched long, and the hair on the back of my neck prickled like there were unseen eyes on me. I followed the old cattle trails, flashlight cutting through the gloom. The air was thick with the smell of sage and something else, musky, animalistic. I kept my hand on my service pistol, more out of nerves than any real expectation of needing it. Then I heard it, a rustling sound, like something large moving through the scrub. I froze, heart thudding in my chest. My flashlight beam bounced wildly across the rocks, but I caught a flash of movement just beyond its reach. It was gone as quick as it appeared. I moved forward cautiously scanning the darkness. Up ahead, there was a break in the rock, a sort of hidden alcove. As I got closer, the stench hit me full force. Rotting meat and something fouler, a smell that sent a shiver of pure revulsion down my spine. My flashlight swept across the alcove, and I nearly choked back a scream. There, piled in a grotesque heap, were the remains of Silas' cattle. Their bodies were shriveled, desiccated, as though every ounce of fluid had been wrung from them. But that wasn't the worst of it. One of the carcasses was moving, twitching, spasming, as if something alive was struggling within the empty husk of skin. That's when I saw it. It slithered out from beneath the pile of dead cattle, a creature as tall as a man, yet gaunt and skeletal. Its skin was taut and pale, stretched over a frame impossibly thin. Its head was hunched low, and as it turned to face me, I saw its eyes. Empty pits, glowing with a sickly yellow light. The creature let out a hiss, a sound that crawled under my skin. Its mouth opened wide, unnaturally wide, revealing rows of needle-like teeth. I swear to this day— the damn thing almost smiled at me. Panic surged through me, overriding any semblance of training. I fumbled for my gun, drawing it with shaking hands. I fired off a shot, more of a reflexive jerk than any kind of aim. The bullet slammed into the creature's shoulder, 
and it jerked back with a screech. But it didn't fall. Didn't even seem hurt. It hissed again, baring those terrible teeth, then lunged. I fired again and again, the roar of the gunshots echoing through the canyon. I don't know how many shots hit their mark, but the thing was relentless. It closed the distance with unnatural speed, long, skeletal arms reaching out for me. Blind terror propelled me. I dropped the gun, turned and ran. I heard the creature snarling behind me, its clawed feet scrabbling over rock. The canyon walls blurred as I sprinted, breath rasping in my lungs. Up ahead, I saw a break in the rocks, a narrow crevice leading out of the alcove. Without thinking, I squeezed through it, scraping my knees and elbows on the rough stone. The thing was too big to follow, and I heard its screech in frustration behind me. I kept running, scrambling through the canyon in the fading light. Finally, I burst onto the main trail, chest heaving. I risked a look back, half expecting the creature to emerge from the shadows. But there was nothing. Just the wind whistling through the rocks. I made it back to my cruiser, hands trembling so bad I could barely get the keys in the ignition. I radioed for backup, voice cracking as I reported what I'd encountered. Of course, the other officers thought I was crazy. Ran into one of those feral dog packs, maybe, they said. Or some junkie out of his mind. No one believed a word about the thing I'd seen. They never found any trace of the creature out there in Seji. Not that they looked real hard. And I never saw it again, though some nights I dream of those empty, glowing eyes. Silas Begay disappeared about a month later. Never found a sign of him. They dismissed me as a rookie who'd spooked himself in the dark, but I knew what I saw. After that night, I became obsessed. I spent every spare hour digging through old reports, scouring local legends and folktales. It was in the back of the tribal library, tucked away in a dusty old volume of Navajo mythology, that I found it, the Skinwalker. Legend described it as a malevolent witch, capable of transforming into monstrous beasts. But the stories seemed mostly concerned with curses and bad luck, not the bloodthirsty creature I'd encountered. Yet, it was the closest thing I had to an answer. And if the legends were even half true, skinwalkers were damn near unkillable. Conventional weapons wouldn't stop the thing, and now it knew I was out there. I confided in an old medicine man out on the reservation, a man named Hosteen Yazi. He listened to my tale, his face etched with a mixture of concern and grim understanding. When I finished, he puffed on a hand-rolled cigarette before finally speaking. There are old ways to fight such things, he said. Ways forgotten by most. He explained that skinwalkers were vulnerable to weapons coated in white ash, to rituals steeped in ancient tradition. It was a slim chance, but it was better than nothing. With Hose Team Yazzie's guidance, I began preparing. The ash ritual took days, meticulous work that left me exhausted but strangely resolute. I modified a few rounds from my revolver, coating the bullets by hand. I knew the old ways weren't a sure thing, but facing that creature again with nothing more than lead felt like suicide. The waiting was the worst part. I kept expecting the creature to come for me, to stalk me in the darkness. Every creak of my floorboards, every rustle in the wind, set my nerves on edge. I barely slept, haunted by nightmares of those hungry yellow eyes. Then, one night it came. Not for me, though. For Clara Bowlegs, an elderly woman who lived alone out on the edge of the reservation. I got the call on the police radio, a possible animal attack. But I knew in my bones what I'd find out there. When I'd pulled up to Clara's place, the stench of death hung heavy in the air. Her little cabin was a shambles, 
the door torn off its hinges. A trail of blood led into the surrounding scrubland. I followed it, flashlight cutting a path through the darkness, my heart lodged in my throat. I found Clara in a clearing, or what was left of her. Her body was mangled, torn, barely recognizable. There were no animal tracks. Only the footprints of something far too large, far too human, to be natural. And nearby, lurking in the shadows just beyond the reach of my light, I saw the creature. Still impossibly thin, its sickly eyes trained on me with chilling intelligence. Rage boiled up in me, a burning need to avenge Clara, to end this nightmare once and for all. I steadied my aim and fired. The creature shrieked, a bone-jarring sound that split the night as the white ash-coated bullet tore through its flesh. It stumbled, hissing in pain, then turned and bolted into the shadows. I pursued, reloading with frantic hands. I could hear it up ahead, crashing through the undergrowth with surprising speed for something so gaunt. Each gunshot pierced the darkness and each time the creature cried out in pain. I wasn't sure how many shots it would take to bring it down, but I wasn't about to stop. The trail led me back into a secluded canyon, too familiar a canyon. It was the same place where I'd first encountered the beast, the same alcove littered with desiccated cattle carcasses. There was a flicker of movement deeper inside, and I gritted my teeth, pushing through the stench of decay to follow. What I saw in that hidden recess made my blood run cold. There, crouched amidst the bones and shadows, was the creature. It had shed its grotesque, skeletal form, transforming into something vaguely human, yet utterly wrong. It was Silas Begay, the missing rancher. Or what was left of him. His skin was sallow, stretched over protruding bones, matching the monstrous form I'd hunted. His eyes, those terrible glowing pits, fixed on me with a mix of agony and hatred. Why? he rasped, the voice barely more than a death rattle. I couldn't speak. The revelation hit me like a physical blow. Had the creature somehow infected Silas? Possessed him? Or was this the skinwalker's true form all along? Silas, the skinwalker, lunged. I fired again and again, until the gun clicked empty. Silas collapsed to the ground, riddled with bullets, the light fading from his eyes. As he took his final shuddering breath, his form dissolved, melting into a puddle of viscous, black liquid that seeped into the earth beneath him. The aftermath was a mess of unanswered questions and lingering horror. The official story was a rabid animal attack, a cover-up designed to keep the panic at bay. Clara's death was a tragedy, Silas merely another missing person's case in the vastness of the Navajo Nation. But the truth, the truth was mine to bear. I left the police force shortly after. Couldn't stomach the lies, the half-truths, anymore. Took up work as a ranch handout in a remote stretch of the reservation, where the nights are long and the old stories feel a little too real. Sometimes, when the wind whispers through the canyons, I think I hear a hiss on the breeze, and a cold shiver runs down my spine. Because out there in the vastness of the desert, under skies older than time, some legends refuse to die. The year was 1978. I was a young deputy on the Navajo Nation Reservation, still green behind the ears. People called me Tsosi. Back then, I thought I'd seen the worst of humanity out here. Drunks, brawls, and the occasional domestic dispute that turned ugly. Turns out, real horror doesn't wear a familiar face. It started with missing livestock. Eerie, considering how ranchers out in these parts keep a hawk's eye on their herds. 
wasn't just cattle, sheep, horses, even a few dogs. At first, folks blamed coyotes or mountain lions. Big predators, yes, but they leave a mess. These disappearances were clean, surgical. No blood, no tracks, no sign of struggle. Then, old man Ho's teen Bill Gay reported seeing something near his Hogan, something, wrong. He described a figure, tall and hunched, its limbs too long and thin, moving with a jerky, unnatural gait. Skin pale as moonlight, stretched tight over bone. Eyes that glowed yellow, like a cat's. Sounded like the ramblings of an old man who had too much firewater. But Bill Gay, he wasn't the type to see things that weren't there. Next, it was Emily Tsosi, a girl of about sixteen, gone missing from her family's property up near Black Mesa. Search parties combed the desert for days. Nothing. We found her horse, or what was left of it, out in a dry wash. Mangled isn't a strong enough word. Looked like something had torn it apart with freakish strength. Fear hung heavy in the air, a prickling sensation at the back of my neck I couldn't shake. I started investigating on my own, talking to folks, digging into the old stories. It was my grandmother who first said the word, Skinwalker. She wove me tales of those malevolent beings from Navajo legend, witches who could shed their humanity and take the form of monstrous creatures. I dismissed them as myths back then, stories to scare children into behaving. Yet the pieces were starting to fit, the livestock, the clean kills, and Hostine's sighting. Could this truly be the work of something out of nightmares? My search led me to a man named Benali, a respected Hatelii, a medicine man. Lived in a trailer out on the outskirts of the res, mostly kept to himself. He was reluctant to speak, but I saw the worry creasing his weathered face. Finally, he told me what I both feared and desperately needed to know. There are ways to fight such evil, but they're dangerous, he rasped. Old ways mostly forgotten. He explained how certain weapons, when blessed with the proper rituals, could harm a skinwalker, force it back into its human form. It was a long shot, maybe a fool's errand, but I was desperate. Emily Tsosi's face kept me awake at night, her fate hanging over me like a storm cloud. Preparing took the better part of a week. Benali oversaw the rituals, chanting prayers in the old tongue and carefully treating my gun with white ash. We modified the bullets, carving them down, coating them with more of the ash. He drilled into me the one, crucial truth. The skinwalker was likely someone from the community, someone I might even know. That thought chilled me to the core. One night, news came over the police radio that something was loose at the abandoned trading post at Two Guns. Old ruins, crumbling adobe and rusted metal. People steered clear of that place, said it was cursed perfect for something inhuman to hide, I figured. I drove out there alone, the headlights of my cruiser cutting through the desolate darkness. When I arrived, the stench of death hit me like a gut punch. My flashlight beam found a dead coyote, its body torn and twisted as though in the grip of something immensely powerful. And then I saw it, a figure hunched within the ruins, its shadow shifting and wavering against the crumbling walls. It was as Bill Gay had described, tall, too tall, and gaunt as a starving man. Its head hung low, then snapped up as I approached, revealing those piercing yellow eyes. I raised my gun, hands shaking, and shouted at the creature, trying to disguise the sheer terror coursing through my veins. It hissed, a venomous rasp, and lunged with an agility that defied its skeletal form. I fired once, twice. The shots tore into its flesh and it shrieked, staggering backward. I kept firing, advancing on the creature, driven by fear and the desperate hope of stopping it, 
of saving whoever else it might take. The creature stumbled, hissing in rage and pain. It clutched at a crumbling wall, and a chunk of adobe fell, revealing something that turned my blood to ice. Beneath the dust and grime, I glimpsed a faded mural, an ancient Navajo depiction of a skinwalker. And painted beside it was a face. A face I recognized. It was Thomas Nez, a rancher, respected in the community. Lived alone since his wife passed. A quiet man. But that face on the mural, it couldn't be a coincidence. The creature lunged again, and I fired instinctively. The bullet struck it square in the chest, and it let out a howl that was more human than animal. Nez, the skinwalker, collapsed against the wall, his form shifting, contorting. The monstrous shape began to shrink, features softening and losing their nightmarish cast. When it was over, Thomas Nez lay crumpled on the dirt floor, bullet wounds seeping blood, the yellow glow fading from his eyes. I stood there, gun still raised, my mind reeling. How? Why? The question swirled unanswered in my head. I radioed for backup and an ambulance, knowing the official story would be about a deranged man, an animal attack gone wrong. The truth, the weight of what had happened out there in the darkness, was a burden I would carry alone. The aftermath was a blur. Ness succumbed to his wounds in the hospital. His death was ruled an unfortunate accident, a recluse driven to madness and violence. The disappearances ceased, Emily Tsosi's name fading into one more tragic mystery of the reservation. Life, in its cruel way, moved on. I never returned to two guns. Some places hold on to darkness, and that was one of them. Benali, the medicine man, passed away a few years later. He took the old secrets with him, leaving me the sole keeper of a terrible truth. Sometimes, I dream of that night, of the creature, of the faded Nero, and of the face of a man I used to know. And I wonder, are there others out there, still lurking in the vastness of the desert? Waiting for the night they can shed their human skin and walk as monsters once more? The thought leaves me sleepless, forever a watcher in the shadows. I was working as a ranger in the Gila National Forest back in 1978. My name's Harlan Eagletooth, and let me tell you, I love that job. Fresh air, stunning scenery, and the satisfaction of protecting something so precious, it couldn't get much better. I'd grown up on the reservation, so being out in the wilderness felt like coming home. One early August morning, I was patrolling a remote stretch near the west fork of the Gila River. It was hot, hotter than it should have been for that time of year. The forecast said we were in for a scorcher. I'd been out since dawn, and already my uniform felt like the inside of an oven. Still, there was something about the stillness, the way the sunlight filtered through the pines, that brought me a sense of calm. That calm shattered when I heard a crackle over the radio. Dispatch, voice tense, said there'd been a report of a missing hiker, a young woman named Emily Peterson. Her campsite had been found abandoned downriver, and they were sending out a search party. I was the closest ranger to her last known location. Emily was easy to picture, the kind of girl who did yoga on her lunch break and always had a perfectly coordinated hiking outfit. But the wilderness doesn't care about Lululemon leggings. If she was out here alone, and something had happened, a flicker of unease ran through me. I followed the river downstream, the terrain getting trickier. Thick undergrowth gave way to rocky outcroppings that rose sharply along the water's edge. The radio crackled again. Search and rescue was mobilizing but wouldn't be on site for several hours. 
Suddenly, I tripped over a tangle of roots. My binoculars slammed into a rock. Cursing, I knelt to examine the damage. One lens was completely cracked. Great. Just what I needed. As I got back to my feet, something caught my eye. A flash of color in an otherwise monochromatic landscape. Just downstream, snagged on a cluster of rocks, was a bright purple backpack. My heart pounded. That had to be Emily's. I scrambled down toward the pack. It looked freshly torn, like it had gotten caught on something sharp. There were dark smears on the fabric, but in the glaring midday sun, I couldn't tell if it was dirt or something worse. Suddenly, I heard a rustle behind me. I spun around, but whatever made the noise was gone. Probably an elk or a deer, I figured, shaken by my sudden movement. Still, after Emily's disappearance, my nerves were on edge. I called out, my voice loud in the stillness. Emily? Emily Peterson, this is Ranger Eagle Tooth. Silence. My hand went to the gun at my hip, but that felt like an overreaction. There was no one out here but me, Emily, and maybe a scared animal. I turned back to the backpack, pulling out my pocket knife and cutting it free. I knew I shouldn't disturb potential evidence, but I needed to know if there was a first aid kit inside. Emily might be hurt, waiting somewhere nearby. My knife sliced through the last strap and the backpack fell open. Inside, there was nothing. No medical supplies, no water bottle, not even a crumpled granola bar wrapper. Just darkness. A dark, wet smear and a sickeningly sweet smell, like rotting fruit. Oh God! I breathed the blood draining from my face. I knew Emily couldn't be too far away. Whatever happened, it must have been sudden, violent. I heard another rustle. This time it was much closer, definitely not the movement of a deer. With trembling hands I drew my gun. I didn't know what animal could have done this to the backpack, but I couldn't rule anything out. The bushes parted. I'll try to tell you what I saw, but the truth is, my brain still glitches trying to process it. It was big. Too big to be a bear, and shaped all wrong. Its skin was a dark mottled brown, wrinkled like an old tree trunk, but there was a sickly luminescence to it. Its head, God, I think I went a bit mad right there, looked something like a wolf's. But those weren't just teeth in its gaping maw. They were long, curving like tusks, stained dark red. Its eyes were completely black. No whites, no pupils, just two voids staring out at me. It lunged. I fired, more out of instinct than any hope of hitting it. The sound echoed along the canyon walls, deafeningly loud in the previous silence. The creature made a noise a kind of inhuman shriek that vibrated in my chest. It backed off a few steps, its eyes still fixed on me. I fired again. This time the bullet seemed to find its mark. There was a wet thump, and the creature let out a roar. But it wasn't a roar of pain. It sounded almost excited. The creature charged again. I stumbled backward, my feet slipping in the loose dirt. I fired wildly, the empty shell casings pinging off the rocks. The creature moved unbelievably fast. My gun clicked empty, and a wave of panic washed over me. I fumbled for a spare magazine, but my hands were shaking so badly I could barely get a grip. The creature was almost upon me, its stench overpowering. Without thinking, I lunged forward, not away from the creature, but towards it. I slammed the empty gun into its snout with all the force I could muster. There was a crack, and the creature staggered, blood and something foul-smelling splattering my face. Seizing my chance, I bolted. 
I didn't know where I was going, only that I needed distance. My breath sawed in and out of my lungs. Branches whipped at my face, stones tore at the soles of my feet, but I kept running. I must have covered a mile before I finally collapsed behind a fallen log, sucking air back into my aching lungs. I lay there, shaking, listening to the pounding of my own heart. Slowly, the adrenaline subsided, leaving me with a cold, gnawing fear. Whatever that thing was, it wasn't a bear, wolf, or mountain lion. There was nothing out in these woods that could have taken Emily, ripped up her pack, then attacked me so relentlessly. And that, that face. Those eyes. There was an intelligence there, a twisted sentience that chilled me to the bone. It wasn't just hunting, it was playing. After what felt like forever, I gathered myself enough to stand. My gun was long gone, lost in the scramble. I need to get back to the ranger station, report this, and get reinforcements. Maybe there was still some hope for Emily. My legs felt like jelly, but I forced them to move. I recognized the landmark I'd passed earlier, and it gave me a flicker of hope. I was almost back to the trail. I could make it. Then I heard it again. That rustling sound, followed by an unnatural, snuffling chuff. Panic seized me again. It was following me. I broke into a desperate run, but my legs were giving out. The trail was just ahead, just a few more yards, and then something slammed into me from the side. The world exploded into pain. There was a deafening crunch, and then my shoulder was on fire. I screamed, the sound echoing through the trees. I felt myself being dragged, my feet useless against its strength. I thrashed, trying to claw my way free, but it was futile. Through a haze of fear-fueled adrenaline, I could see the creature dragging me towards a cluster of trees. Its black eyes gleamed in the filtered light, and a low growl rumbled deep in its chest. Then, everything went dark. I don't know how long I drifted in that state, on the edge of consciousness. My shoulder throbbed, and the nauseating smell of the creature was burned into my nostrils. When I finally opened my eyes, it was dusk. The creature was gone. I was lying on the forest floor, my shoulder pulsing with a dull, persistent pain. Every breath felt like fire. I tried to move, but a wave of dizziness almost made me pass out again. My radio was gone along with my gun, and the only weapon I had left was my pocket knife. Not exactly a fair fight. Survival instinct kicked in. Weak as I was, I had to try crawling back towards the trail, hope someone came looking for me. But as I struggled upright, something caught my eye. A few yards away, half hidden under a pile of leaves, was Emily's purple backpack. Panic and desperation gave me a sudden burst of strength. Ignoring the pain... I lurched towards the pack, tearing through it with shaking fingers. There was nothing useful inside, no food, no water, but I wasn't looking for supplies. There, nestled at the very bottom of the pack, was her cell phone. I grabbed it, the screen cracked but still miraculously intact. A flicker of hope ignited in my chest. If I could reach a signal, if I could get a call out, my hands trembled as I punched in 911, the numbers feeling slippery under my blood-smeared fingers. The phone rang once, twice, and then a woman's voice, crisp and clear, came on the line. 911, what is your emergency? I choked out the words, my voice ragged. This is Ranger Eagle Tooth. I need help. Gila National Forest. And then, the world spun again. I felt a sharp blow to the back of my head. The phone slipped from my grasp. As my vision dimmed, I saw the creature rise out of the shadows, 
its dark eyes glinting in the gathering twilight. They tell me a search party found me the next morning, unconscious and badly injured. Emily was never found. The official story was that I'd been attacked by a rabid animal, maybe a bear or a mountain lion. But I know what I saw out there. They think I'm traumatized, that I hallucinated. Or maybe they decided the truth was too terrifying to accept. I'm back on the job in a few months, desk duty, until I can pass the physical again. No one believes my story, of course. But sometimes at night, when I close my eyes, I smell that rotting stench, hear the rustling in the darkness, see those monstrous black eyes. I know it's out there, still prowling through those ancient woods. And that creature, whatever it was, maybe the old stories on the reservation were right all along. Maybe there are things in this world older, darker, and hungrier than we can ever truly understand. Skinwalkers It was 1988, and I was working a summer job as a fire lookout in the remote stretch of the Absaraka Mountains up in Wyoming. Name's Eli Redhawk. Back then, I was fresh out of high school on the reservation, and desperate for some cash and adventure before starting college in the fall. They stuck me in a creaky old tower perched on a mountain peak, watching for smoke and lightning strikes. It wasn't exactly glamorous, but the pay was decent and the views couldn't be beat. Days up in that tower were long and mostly eventless. I'd pass the time reading paperbacks, scanning the horizon, and wishing I had a girlfriend instead of a stack of old westerns. But one afternoon, around mid-July, things got interesting. I was doing my routine skin when I noticed something odd down below. A big animal, maybe a deer or an elk, had wandered into a meadow, but it was moving strangely. I zoomed in with the binoculars and felt a jolt of unease. This wasn't any animal I recognized. It was massive, easily twice the size of any elk, and its fur was a patchy mess of brown and black, some spots mangy and bare. Its head was long, almost wolfish, but the snout seemed blunt, stubby. And those legs, they were too long, giving it an ungainly, almost spider-like movement. I called it into the ranger station, mostly because I figured this deformed critter needed to be put down. They told me to stay vigilant, that they'd send someone out to investigate. I watched for the rest of the day, that weird beast shuffling around the meadow, but no ranger ever showed. The next morning, I was awakened before sunrise by a commotion down below. A group of hikers, college-aged kids from the look of them, had set up camp near the strange creature. I thought about radioing to warn them, but figured there was no way that scrawny beast could pose a threat to them. They were laughing, someone was even playing a guitar. Besides, backup was due to arrive and relieve me in a few hours and I didn't want to start my day getting reprimanded by the head ranger for some false alarm. About an hour later, I heard screaming. I dropped my coffee mug and fumbled for the binoculars. The campsite was chaos. The animal was there, only now it seemed even bigger, its fur bristling. People were scattering, packs flying into the air. A girl was down on the ground, and the thing was over her. I don't remember much about the next few minutes. It was all a blur of adrenaline and panic. I scrambled down the ladder of the tower and bolted towards the meadow. Yelling was useless, the creature was too far away, and it didn't seem to react to human voices anyway. But damn it, I wasn't going to let those kids get hurt if I could do something. I had my rifle with me, just in case. Usually, a warning shot was enough to scare off even the most stubborn bear. 
I reached the edge of the meadow and stopped short. The sight that greeted me was so horrifying it felt like a nightmare. The girl was still down, but the creature had stopped whatever it was doing to her. It was crouched over the body of one of the boys, a skinny kid with dreadlocks who'd been playing the guitar just an hour before. And the creature, it was tearing into him, its blunt snout ripping into his flesh, blood splattering everywhere. Rage surged through me. I raised my rifle and took unsteady aim. I knew how far a bullet could travel, that the other hikers were within range. But I couldn't think straight. All I wanted was to kill this thing, make it pay. My shot echoed through the mountains. There was a sickening thud, and the creature jolted, raising its head. Dark liquid dripped from its maw. But then it turned towards me, and that's when I saw its eyes. They were human. Pale blue, filled with a cold intelligence that made my blood run cold. This wasn't just an animal, deformed or not. This was a monster with a man's eyes, and it was fixing me with a glare that seemed almost calculating. It took a menacing step towards me, and I knew I wouldn't get another shot off in time. I turned and ran. I ran like I'd never run in my life. I could hear the creature's grunting breaths, the pounding of its strangely shaped paws on the earth. Branches whipped at my face, stones tore at the soles of my feet, but I kept running. My lungs burned, but the adrenaline pushed me on. I stumbled, fell, scrambled up again, and tore off into the forest. Behind me, the creature's footsteps faded, but I didn't dare slow down. I stumbled through the undergrowth, my breath rasping in my throat. I had no idea where I was going, just that I couldn't go back. Not while that thing was still out there. Finally, exhausted, I collapsed behind a fallen tree trunk. I lay there gasping, my heart pounding. I closed my eyes, then immediately forced them open again. If I fell asleep, I might never wake up. After what felt like an eternity, I regained enough strength to push myself up. My legs shook, but I started walking again, picking a direction at random and stumbling through the dense forest. The sun was dipping below the horizon, plunging the woods into an unsettling twilight. Hours passed, or maybe only minutes, I had no way to tell. I was delirious with fear and exhaustion. And then, when I was on the verge of giving in to despair, I saw it, a dirt road. I stumbled out of the woods and collapsed onto the gravel, too weak to stand. But salvation was within reach. All I needed to do was crawl. Maybe it was the adrenaline or pure desperation, but I found the strength to drag myself along the road. My knees and palms burned, but I pushed on. And then, a miracle, I heard the rumble of an engine. Headlights pierced the darkness, and a battered old pickup truck skidded to a halt in front of me. A man with a deeply weathered face leaned out the window. What in the hell happened to you? He asked, his voice a mix of concern and suspicion. I tried to speak, but my throat was raw. I just pointed back towards the woods, my eyes wide with terror. He understood. Get in, he grunted, hauling me into the passenger seat. The truck lurched forward, and I didn't look back. We didn't speak for the rest of the drive. The man took me to a ranger station, and soon I was surrounded by worried faces. I told them everything, my voice shaking, the creature in the meadow, the kids, the man's eyes. They looked at me like I was crazy, probably assumed I'd fallen off my tower and hit my head. But one old ranger, a grizzled veteran named Hank, listened without judgment. He asked specific questions about the creature's size, its movements, the way it looked at me. And after I'd finished, he said something that chilled me to the bone. Sounds like you ran into a skinwalker. 
I'd heard the word before, of course. Old stories on the reservation about shape-shifting witches, creatures that could take animal form. But I always thought they were just tales meant to scare kids. Hank told me about other disappearances in the area, livestock found torn apart, sightings of unidentifiable creatures. He said there were old stories about these woods, stories from long before the white men came. He believed me. I was hospitalized for a few days while they treated my injuries, then released. I never went back to my tower. I dropped out of college before the fall semester even started and went home to the reservation. For weeks, I couldn't sleep without seeing those pale blue eyes in the darkness. It was my grandfather who finally helped me get a grip on myself. These things, they feed on fear, he said. Don't let it have that power over you. He took me to a medicine man, and together they performed a ceremony to protect me, to drive out the lingering shadow that clung to my spirit. Years have passed. I have a wife, kids, a good job as a mechanic. Most days, I don't think about what happened up in those mountains. But sometimes, at night, when a stray dog howls, a prickle of fear runs down my spine. I think about the hikers I couldn't save, and I wonder if that creature is still out there, lurking in the wild places. They say time heals all wounds. They're wrong. Some scars run deep, and sometimes the monsters in the old stories... Well, maybe they're more real than we'd like to believe. And somewhere, deep in the wilderness, I think a monster with human eyes remembers me too. The year was 1972, and I was 16 years old, living on the Navajo Reservation in Arizona. Back then, I was all about my dirt bike, hanging out with my buddies, and figuring out how to sneak beers from the trading post. My name's Sam Blackhorse. Life was pretty chill until that weekend my cousin Joe went missing. Joe wasn't the type to wander off on his own. He was a tough kid, a year older than me, always up for an adventure, but he wasn't reckless. And this wasn't just wandering off. His bicycle was found miles from our houses, abandoned on the side of the road. Something was seriously wrong. The whole reservation got involved in the search. Me, my buddies, half the tribal police, we combed the dry washes in the arroyos, but there was no sign of Joe. It was like he'd vanished into thin air. That night, my grandfather sat me down. He lit a pipe the scent of the tobacco filling the room, and told me about things that don't fit into textbooks. He told me about the skinwalkers. I rolled my eyes. Skinwalkers were like boogeymen, stories to scare kids. I'd heard the tales, of course, about witches who could transform into animals and steal people away. But I figured those were just warnings to keep us from sneaking around at night. This is different, my grandfather said, his voice low and serious. There is evil stirring. I wanted to scoff, but something in his eyes made me listen. He told me about how his father, my great-grandfather, also battled something dark in these lands. He said the land itself harbors old power and that some people are more susceptible to its influence. Maybe Joe wild, restless Joe, had seen something he shouldn't have. The next morning, armed with my grandfather's warnings, I borrowed a pickup truck and headed towards where Joe's bike had been found. If there was something out there, some skinwalker, maybe I could find a sign, bring Joe home. I drove along the empty desert road, the sun beating down. In the distance, there was a dark shape, a smudge on the horizon. I slowed down, a chill running down my spine. At first, I thought it might be a coyote or a stray dog. 
But as I got closer, something seemed off about it. I parked the truck and stepped out, the desert heat pressing down on me. As I approached, the creature raised its head, and I froze. It looked like a wolf at first, but too tall, its posture all wrong. The fur was sparse and uneven, revealing patches of raw, mottled skin. Its snout was long and wet, the teeth glinting in the sunlight. And the eyes, those eyes were a chilling yellow, filled with a cold, calculating malice. It stared at me, as if sizing me up. And then, with a growl that vibrated in my chest, it lunged. I scrambled back, fumbling in my pocket for the pocket knife my grandfather had given me. The creature landed right where I'd been standing, throwing up a cloud of dust. It circled me, making low, guttural noises. My heart raced. All those stories, they weren't just stories, after all. I raised my knife, my hand shaking. This was stupid. A pocket knife against a monster? But as it lunged again, I did the only thing I could think of. I yelled. My voice echoed through the emptiness. The creature faltered, its yellow eyes narrowing. Maybe the sudden noise startled it. I yelled again, louder, waving the knife around and backing up slowly towards the truck. The creature hesitated, then turned and slunk away into the brush, disappearing back towards the horizon. I made it back to my truck, my legs feeling like jelly. I didn't look back until I was miles down the road. When I finally pulled up to my house, my grandfather was standing on the porch. You saw it, he said, his voice full of weary knowledge. I just nodded handing him my pocket knife. The blade was bent. Joe was never found. The police eventually wrote it off as a runaway case, but I know better. My grandfather said I'd been lucky that day, that whatever spirit had taken Joe, it didn't want another victim, not right then. I've carried that bent knife with me ever since, a reminder of what lurks out there in the shadows of the desert. People don't believe in skinwalkers anymore, not really. They say it's all superstition. But I've seen the yellow eyes, felt the cold weight of that stare. I know the truth, and it's a truth I wish I could forget. After that day in the desert, life was never the same. Everywhere I went, I felt like I was being watched. The wind whistling through the mesquite sounded like whispers and the shadows seemed to take on strange shapes. I tried to brush it off, but I couldn't shake the feeling that evil was still out there, lurking. Then came the nightmares. I'd see Joe's face, pale and terrified, reaching out to me. And those yellow eyes, always those eyes, burning into my soul. I started jumping at every sound, and I barely slept. My grandfather tried to help. He performed a protection ceremony, burning sage and chanting prayers. It gave me some measure of comfort, but it couldn't erase the memory of what I had seen. The years passed. I graduated high school, got a job at the hardware store, and tried to put the skinwalker behind me. But it was always there, a shadow on the edge of my thoughts. I tried to warn others subtly, dropping hints, oblique references, but people just laughed at me. They thought I was crazy, or maybe making up some wild story for attention. The isolation started to eat away at me. Maybe, I thought, I could track it down, hunt the skinwalker like it had hunted Joe. I took long drives into the wilderness, my grandfather's old rifle on the passenger seat. I'd look for any sign, a disturbance in the sand— a flicker of yellow eyes in the twilight. But there was nothing. The skinwalker was always one step ahead, a phantom in the desert. Then one day, I was driving home from work, the sun beginning to set. As I rounded a bend in the road, I saw it, the creature, standing in the middle of the highway. 
My heart leaped into my throat. There was no time to think. I slammed on the brakes. The truck skidded on the loose gravel, tires squealing, but it was too late. There was a sickening thud, and then silence. I climbed out of the truck, shaking. The creature was crumpled on the road, a tangle of twisted limbs. Cautiously, I approached it. Up close, the stench was overpowering. I could see that patches of its fur had been burned away, revealing scabby, leathery skin. It was still alive, one yellow eye cracked open, filled with pain and hatred. A wave of guilt washed over me. Had I just killed some sick animal? No. This was the skinwalker. There was no mistaking it. Even injured, it radiated an aura of malevolence that chilled me to the bone. I took a step back and reached into the truck for the rifle. It was over. I could put this thing out of its misery, and maybe finally have some peace. I raised the gun and took aim. But as I looked into that yellow eye, a flicker of doubt crossed my mind. What if this was just some poor deformed creature? What if my grandfather was wrong, and I'd just been tormented by fear all these years? My finger hovered on the trigger. And then, with a surge of strength that surprised me, the creature lunged. I stumbled back, and the rifle went flying. I scrambled to my feet, running blindly. The skinwalker was close behind, its ragged breathing a harsh rasp. I knew I wouldn't make it to the truck. Out of desperation, I veered off the road, towards the looming canyon. There was a sheer drop just up ahead, the only place I could think to escape. I could feel the creature gaining on me, hear its guttural snarls. Closer and closer. The edge of the cliff appeared suddenly before me. I had no time to stop. With a desperate shout, I leaped. The last thing I saw was the creature's yellow eyes widening in surprise, and then I was falling. The wind whistled in my ears, and the ground rushed up to meet me. And then, nothing. When I awoke, I was lying at the bottom of the canyon, my body battered and broken. Somehow, miraculously, I was still alive. The skinwalker was nowhere in sight. With immense effort, I dragged myself out of the canyon, back to the road, and eventually managed to flag down a passing car that took me to a hospital. They told me it was a miracle I'd survived the fall. I spent weeks in the hospital, then months in rehab. My body healed, but my mind, that's another story. The nightmares are still there, the fear. But there's also a newfound strength. I survived the skinwalker. I survived the impossible. I moved away from the reservation, found a job in a small town where nobody knew my name or my history. I live a quiet life now. But sometimes, when the nights are long, I look out the window, half expecting to see a pair of glowing yellow eyes staring back. Maybe it's still out there. Maybe someday, it'll hunt me down and finish what it started. Or maybe, and this is the thought that truly terrifies me, maybe I took something of it with me into the world, some dark seed of the skinwalker that festers somewhere deep inside me, waiting to emerge. The year was 2008, and I was working the night shift as a security guard at a remote research station up in the Cascade Mountains of Washington State. Kind of like those outposts you see in sci-fi movies. But instead of hunting aliens, these guys were studying climate change and whatnot. My name's Henry Little Bear. Grew up on the Yakama Reservation, did a few tours in the Marines and drifted into security work when I got out. The pay was decent, and I figured keeping tabs on a bunch of brainiacs couldn't be that difficult. Evenings were mostly quiet, 
checking security cameras, walking the perimeter, that kind of stuff. The only excitement I ever got was when the odd critter triggered a motion sensor. One crisp October night, things started to get weird. I was doing my rounds when I noticed one of the outbuildings, a storage shed used for old gear, was unlocked. Strange. I was sure I'd locked it just an hour before. Maybe one of the scientists had needed something, forgot to shut it? I shrugged, pulled out my flashlight, and cautiously approached the shed. Inside, it was a mess, shelves overturned, tools scattered across the floor, like somebody had gone through it in a hurry. Frowning, I stepped over the debris to get a closer look. That's when I saw the blood. A whole lot of it. Splashes on the floor, streaks leading out the other door. My heart started to pound. Something wasn't right here. I radioed to the main facility, my voice tight. Something's happened at Storage Shed 3. Looks like there might have been an accident. They patched me through to the head of security, who sounded less than pleased to be woken up. He told me to wait for backup, to not touch anything. Great. Like that was comforting. With nothing else to do, I cautiously followed the blood trail. It led out into the woods, away from the facility. I figured this was now a job for the police, but something kept me going. There was a part of me, maybe that old marine instinct, that knew somebody out there might need help. The deeper I got into the woods, the darker it became. The blood trail was getting harder to follow. I reached for my flashlight, just as a twig snapped behind me. I whirled around, my heart pounding in my chest. The forest was silent. Probably just a deer, I told myself. Still, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up. I continued forward, my footsteps muffled by the damp fallen leaves. The blood trail led me to a small clearing. And that's when I saw it. Crouched in the clearing, partially obscured by the shadows, was a massive creature. Bigger than any bear I'd ever encountered, its fur ragged and patchy in the moonlight. Its posture was all wrong, limbs impossibly long, and its muzzle, it was like a wolf's but something wasn't right. Too long, the teeth glistening unnaturally. Beside the creature lay the body of one of the scientists, a young woman I'd seen around the facility named Claire. My stomach turned. Rage surged through me. I should have listened to my instincts, called for help when I had the chance. Claire might still be alive. The creature was hunched over its prey, tearing into the body. I swallowed back the fear and raised my sidearm. I never had to shoot at anything other than paper targets before, but it was either this creature or me. My first shot echoed through the trees, hitting the creature in the shoulder. It roared, a blood-curdling sound that sent shivers down my spine. The creature reared up, taller than me, and then charged. I fired again and again, the recoil jolting my arm. The creature stumbled, but it kept coming. Terror flooded through me. I was out of ammo. I turned and ran, scrambling through the underbrush. The creature was gaining, its ragged breaths almost in my ears. Behind me, I could hear it crashing through the trees. Up ahead, I saw it drop off, a ravine leading down to the river. It was my only chance. I took a desperate leap. The ground rushed up to meet me. I hit the slope of the ravine hard and tumbled, my body battered by rocks and branches. I landed with a sickening thud at the bottom, the frigid river just a few feet away. Groaning, I tried to move, but a wave of pain washed over me. I'd broken something, leg or ribs, maybe both. Lying there helpless, I listened. There was no sign of the creature. Maybe it hadn't followed me, or maybe it was just circling above, waiting for me to die. 
I forced myself to crawl towards the river. Aching and battered, I managed to scoop up handfuls of the icy water and splash it on my face. The shock of it helped me focus. Dying out here wasn't an option. I looked back up the ravine. Climbing it was impossible, not in my condition. The river was my only way out. The water was freezing, but I figured the current would carry me downstream, where hopefully, I'd find a road or signs of civilization. Mustering what little strength I had left, I dragged myself into the knee-deep water and let the current take me. The cold was excruciating, but the pain helped keep me conscious. The river twisted and turned, and I lost all sense of time. My vision blurred, but I clung to a desperate hope that help was waiting just around the next bend. Hours later, the sun started to break through the trees. I was beyond shivering, my body going numb. There was a roaring in my ears, and blackness started creeping in at the edges of my vision. And then I saw it, a bridge. With a final burst of adrenaline, I fought against the current, struggling towards the bank. I reached out, my fingers scraping against rough wood. I fumbled for a grip and managed to pull myself to safety, collapsing on the muddy riverbank. A truck rumbled over the bridge just as everything went dark. I woke up in a hospital bed days later. The doctor told me some hikers found me unconscious under the bridge, suffering from hypothermia and a broken leg in several places. I told him about the creature, about Claire, but he gave me a sad smile, the same look you reserve for crazy people. The police investigated, of course. Search and rescue scoured the woods, but there was no sign of Claire's body, or any creature matching my description. They wrote it off as a bear attack I somehow miraculously survived, or maybe just a bad case of hallucinations. I was released after weeks of physical therapy. I never went back to that research station, found a different line of work, tried to put it all behind me. It's been years, but I haven't forgotten. Sometimes, late at night, I wake in a cold sweat and think I hear something scratching at my window. During those sleepless hours, I tell myself that what I saw that night was impossible, a figment of my imagination fueled by terror and shock. But then again, part of me wonders. The wild places are vast and full of mysteries. Old stories get passed down for a reason, even those that sound like monster tales. And if creatures like the one I saw, creatures the scientists would call cryptids, exist on the fringes of our world, well, let's just say I sleep with a gun under my pillow now. Maybe the truth is that some old stories, the ones about skinwalkers and other shape-shifting, shadow-dwelling creatures, are based on something horrifyingly real. Something we might never fully understand, Something that reminds us that even in this modern world, the wilderness still holds secrets. And some secrets have very sharp teeth. The year was 1983. My name's David Whitehorse, and that summer I was working on my uncle's ranch out in Wyoming. Beautiful country, but lonely if you're used to living on the reservation like me. Still, the money was good, and the work wasn't so different from what I was used to back home. One evening, as I was mending a fence near a patch of forest, something caught my eye. A deer stood on the edge of the trees, but it looked wrong. Too tall, for dark and uneven, the way a coyote's might look after a fight— and it moved in a jerky way. I whistled, thinking it might be sick, but it just stared at me. Those eyes, they were human, filled with a cold intelligence. A shiver ran down my spine. There was something unnatural about that deer. I turned away, 
trying to brush it off as just my imagination. When I glanced back, it was gone. Relieved, I went about my work, but a sense of unease lingered. The sun was setting, and I decided to finish the fence tomorrow. Better to walk back to the house with some daylight left. As I headed towards the main road, I heard a rustling sound. I spun around, but there was nothing there. Probably just the wind. I picked up the pace, but the rustling kept following me, just out of sight. My heart beat faster. This wasn't natural. I reached for the hunting knife my grandfather had given me. I broke into a run. I could hear the creature, whatever it was, running alongside me, hidden in the tall grass. Up ahead I saw the road, and beyond that, the lights of the ranch house. My lungs burned, but I pushed myself harder. Suddenly, the deer burst out of the grass. Only it wasn't a deer anymore. It was. I don't even know how to describe it. The height of a man, but hunched over like some kind of beast. Its body was twisted, covered in patchy, mange-ridden fur. Its face, that was the worst part. It was almost human, twisted into a cruel parody, with empty, cavernous eyes and a gaping, tooth-filled mouth. A sound escaped me, something between a scream and a sob, and the creature lunged. I threw up an arm, the knife glinting, but it was too fast. It smacked me across the ribs, the force knocking me off my feet. I landed hard, the knife flying from my hand. The creature stood over me, that horrible human-like face inches from mine. I could smell its breath, foul and fetid. A low growl rumbled from its throat. I thrashed against the ground, trying to scramble away, but it was no use. It pinned me with one clawed hand, and then raised the other. I closed my eyes, resigned to my fate. Suddenly, gunshots shattered the night. My eyes flew open. The creature jerked, its inhuman shriek echoing through the silence. I saw a flash of red as it stumbled, and a wave of something hot washed over me. David! My uncle's voice, rough with fear. He stood near the road, rifle still raised. The creature was half-crouched, licking blood from its clawed hand. Its eyes fixed on my uncle, its hunger turning into cold fury. Get in the truck, he yelled, firing another shot. The creature snarled but didn't move closer. I staggered to my feet and ran towards the truck, fear lending strength to my battered body. I fumbled with the door handle, piled inside, and then we were roaring down the road, the sound of gunshots fading behind us. My uncle glanced at me, his face grim. You see it clear? he asked, his voice low. I nodded, the image of that twisted face seared into my brain. He let out a long breath. Skinwalker, he said, the word heavy with the weight of old knowledge. They've always been around. Most folks keep to themselves, but some, some go bad. You were lucky. We arrived back at the ranch house and called the sheriff. He found the deer carcass, what was left of it, out near the forest. My cuts and bruises were blamed on an unlucky encounter with a bear or a mountain lion, the official story covering up a truth too frightening for most folks to understand. I spent that night staring at the shadowed corners of my room. My uncle sat downstairs with his rifle across his lap, keeping silent vigil. I never went back to the forest after that. The ranch still needed tending, of course, but I found ways to avoid that patch of land. My uncle never spoke of the skinwalker again, but the memory of it burned, a shadow always at the edge of my awareness. Nights were the worst. I'd dream of that twisted, hungry face, wake up in a cold sweat, heart pounding. Weeks turned into months, and slowly, 
the wound began to heal, if not fully scar over. My uncle insisted I go back to college that fall, and I eventually agreed. Maybe a change of scenery was what I needed. I told myself I was being stupid, that nightmares weren't real. One rainy November evening, I was walking back to my dorm room. The campus was mostly deserted, students hunkered down in the library or grabbing late dinners. I took a shortcut, a deserted path cut between two buildings, dimly lit under flickering lamps. A rustling sound made me pause. My pulse quickened. Just the wind, I told myself. Just squirrels digging up acorns. But that night in the woods had taught me a chilling lesson. Sometimes, your instincts scream warnings your mind refuses to hear. The rustling intensified, and my heart hammered in my chest. I reached under my jacket, fingers clutching the handle of my hunting knife, now a constant companion. Come out, I called. My voice sounded small and scared even to my own ears. Silence answered, and then the sound of something wet and sticky being ripped apart. I swallowed hard. Whatever was out there, it was eating something. And if it was hungry, I took a slow step backwards, then another. Another wet, tearing sound echoed in the darkness. I broke into a run, no longer caring about hiding. I heard a growl then, inhuman and guttural. The sound spurred me on. I burst out from between the buildings, my breath ragged. I froze. Standing in the pool of light cast by a nearby street lamp was a figure. Human-shaped at first glance, but hunched, the posture all wrong. As my eyes adjusted, I saw the thin, emaciated body, the glint of teeth in a too-wide mouth, the eyes, those empty, terrible eyes. It stared at me with a chilling intensity, then raised a clawed hand. On the ground beside it was the body of a cat, its stomach ripped open. I choked back a scream of horror. It tilted its head, almost curious, and the motion was so eerily human it sent shivers down my spine. Then it dropped to all fours, its body contorting, transforming. In seconds, where a starving, sick man had stood, there prowled a huge wolf, its fur oily and dark in the wet light. I stumbled back, tripped, and landed hard on the ground. The wolf lowered its head, and I saw its teeth. Those teeth that had been tearing into the cat mere moments before were now fixated on me. A whimper escaped me. I was going to die here, in this deserted corner of the campus, just like that deer. A shout rang out, followed by a loud crack. The wolf jerked, snarling. Headlights cut through the drizzle, and a car screeched to a halt nearby. Someone leaped out, a woman yelling, waving a flashlight wildly at the creature. The wolf hesitated, staring at the light, then backed away with a low growl. Still fixated on me, it stalked away, disappearing into the shadows. Students spilled out of the car. Someone knelt beside me, asking if I was okay, but I couldn't focus. I kept seeing those eyes— a chilling mix of animal instinct and twisted human intelligence. The woman who had yelled stood a short distance away, breathing hard. She looked oddly familiar, and then I realized. Sarah? I croaked. It was Sarah Littlefield, a girl from back home, a year older than me. She turned, her eyes widening with recognition. David? What happened? The words spilled out then, the story of the skinwalker, the fear that had plagued me for months. The other students stared, some skeptical, some wide-eyed with horror. Sarah just nodded slowly. I know, she said quietly. There's, there's things out there that people don't understand. I never learned who or what the creature on the campus was. They called it a wolf, a rabid coyote, 
wrote it off as a mass hallucination. But I and Sarah knew the truth. I don't have nightmares as often anymore. Still, every time I walk down a lonely path at night, I remember the hunger in those eyes, the way that Skinwalker had worn a man's face like a mask. And I wonder, was it pure chance I survived that night in Wyoming, random luck that my uncle saved me? Or was there something in my blood, some connection passed down from my ancestors, that marked me, protected me? Maybe some of the old stories have more truth to them than we realize. And maybe the reason the creatures walk in the shadows, disguised as animals or twisted, ravaged humans, is because they know there are still some of us who remember the old stories, who remember how to fight back. It was 1991, a hot summer in the desert country of New Mexico. My name's Ray Yazzie, and I was helping out my cousin with his sheep ranch while trying to figure out what to do with my life after high school. One evening, I was riding fence along the back of the property when I noticed the section was broken down, the barbed wire laying on the ground. At first, I figured a cow had gotten through, then I saw the tracks. They were big, and wrong, too large, and the claws. No coyote or wolf would make marks like that. A jolt of unease ran through me. Even as a city kid from the Navajo Reservation, I'd heard the old stories. I followed the tracks as the sun sank low, casting long, ominous shadows. They led towards an old abandoned homestead a crumbling ruin left over from better days. I should have turned back then, but there was an eerie pull, a need to find out what had been out there in the vastness of the desert. I dismounted from my horse and cautiously approached the old house. The windows were empty, staring holes, and the silence was heavy, oppressive. Something wasn't right. A low sound made me spin around, a growl guttural and chilling. A massive shape loomed in the doorway, blocking the fading light. I blinked, trying to discern details. A wolf, maybe? But far too large, and the posture was all wrong, too upright. My breath caught in my throat. Its muzzle was long and wet, the teeth glistening in the dusk. And the eyes, they blazed with a fierce, hungry intelligence. Shivers ran down my spine. This was no wolf. This was no animal I'd ever seen. I backed away slowly, my heart pounding. It took a step towards me, and I caught a whiff of its breath, the stench of death and something foul, unnatural. I stumbled, and panic surged through me. I turned and ran, my boots thudding against the hard earth. Behind me, I heard the creature roar, a chilling, inhuman sound that seemed to echo through the very air. I glanced back and saw it hurtling towards me, its gangly shape blurring with unnatural speed. It was gaining, its breath rasping in ragged gasps. Ahead was my horse, tied to a tumble-down fence. I raced towards it, hope mingling with terror. If I could just get on its back— I reached for the bridle, and then something slammed into me, knocking me to the ground. The creature was on me in an instant, its weight crushing me, its claws tearing at my clothes. I yelled, thrashing desperately, a flicker of defiance even in the face of certain death. And then, a gunshot split the air. The creature shrieked, rearing back. My cousin stood nearby, rifle held steady. Another shot rang out, and the creature snarled, its eyes blazing with fury. I scrambled to my feet, my heart pounding in my ears. Get to the truck, my cousin yelled, firing again. The creature lunged at him. My cousin stumbled backward, and the rifle clattered to the ground. The creature crouched, 
preparing to attack again. I screamed and fumbled for my pocket knife, the small blade comically inadequate against this monstrous form. Suddenly, a blur of brown and white barreled into the clearing, my cousin's sheepdog. It latched onto the creature's leg, snarling and snapping. The creature twisted, trying to shake the dog off, giving my cousin precious seconds. He dove for the rifle, rolled to his feet, aimed, and fired. The creature howled, and a spray of something dark splattered the dry ground. It turned, its eyes blazing with hatred, and then loped away, strangely uneven, back towards the ruined homestead. We watched it disappear into the twilight, the dog barking furiously until it was out of sight. My legs gave out from under me, and I sat down hard on the dusty ground. My cousin holstered the rifle and knelt beside me. You okay? he asked, his voice laced with worry. I nodded, unable to speak. He helped me to my feet, and together we stood in silence, the air still vibrating with the echo of the creature's inhuman howls. Eventually, we made our way back to the ranch. My cousin bandaged my wounds, saying a wild dog must have gotten to me. I didn't argue. Some truths are too terrible to speak, too hard to believe, even for your own family. The rest of that summer was a blur. I tended sheep with an absent-minded weariness that masked the fear still lodged deep within me. When I closed my eyes, I saw that twisted form, those burning eyes. I jumped at every creak in the old ranch house, every rustle carried by the desert wind. My cousin watched me with worry in his eyes. I knew he thought I was still in shock about the dog attack. One day, while searching for a stray lamb, I came across a gruesome sight, a half-eaten sheep carcass, the scene reminiscent of some wild, unnatural frenzy. This wasn't the clean work of a lone wolf. No. This was something else. A knot of dread formed in the pit of my stomach. It was still out there, lurking. That night, after dinner, I pulled an old dusty book down from a shelf in the barn, a collection of traditional stories my grandfather had given me long ago. I flipped through the pages, stopping at a chillingly familiar description, a creature both man and beast, fueled by dark magic, preying on the living. A skinwalker. The word hung heavy in the air. I'd dismissed the stories as mere myth, but now... A terrible certainty settled upon me. My cousin came into the barn, an oil lamp casting flickering shadows on the walls. I can't stay here, I told him, the words forced out between clenched teeth. He stared at me, confusion in his eyes. I told him everything, the creature, the ruins, what I'd read in the book. He was skeptical at first then his skepticism turned to a grim acceptance. A long-forgotten memory flickered in his eyes. A memory of his own grandfather telling him the same stories mine had told me. There's a way to track them, he said slowly. Something my grandfather taught me, if you're brave enough. The next day, we rode out to the old homestead. We circled the dilapidated building, carefully examining the ground. Finally, my cousin pointed to a faint set of tracks different from the clawed ones I remembered. Human shape, but the prints were far too large. We'd found the skinwalker's trail. We followed the tracks deeper into the desert. The unforgiving sun beat down, and sweat stung my eyes as we traversed the barren landscape. With every step, I felt the lurking presence of the skinwalker, the fear a constant companion. Finally, near an outcropping of jagged rocks, the trail ended abruptly. We're close, my cousin whispered. Be careful now. We crept towards the rocks, my heart pounding. In a small cave, we found him a gnarled old man hunkered in the shadows, skin stretched gaunt over his bones. Beside him, 
a pile of tattered, dirty clothes and the half-eaten carcass of a coyote. As we watched, he convulsed. A horrifying transformation began. His features stretched and warped, and his eyes flared with that same malevolent light. Fur sprouted in uneven patches across his body. When the transformation was complete, there stood the creature from the ruins. We didn't hesitate. We had our rifles. It was him or us. The first shot rang out, echoing against the rocks. The skinwalker roared and twisted, its inhuman eyes fixing on us. We fired again and again until it slumped to the ground, unmoving. A profound silence descended upon the desert. It was over. I thought I'd feel relief, but instead, a wave of complex emotions washed over me, disgust, fear, and a twinge of pity for this creature that was both man and monster. My cousin felt it too. We can't leave him like this, he said. He needs a proper burial, according to tradition, or his spirit won't find peace. We worked in the harsh desert light, digging a shallow grave. The work was grim, but necessary. As the sun began to set, we lowered the body into the grave and covered it with stones, whispering prayers for the troubled soul trapped within that monstrous form. Later we rode home. The encounter left an unshakable mark on us both. I returned to the city, went to college, tried to live a normal life. But I never forgot those desolate desert days, nor the chilling truth they revealed. The world isn't always as it seems, and sometimes, the old stories are true, even if we don't want to believe them. That night, in the safety of my dorm room, I still dreamed of the desert, of the skinwalker, of the hungry gleam in its eyes a constant reminder that the shadows of the past are long, and even in the modern world, darkness lurks just beyond the edge of our sight. It was 1978. I was a high schooler living on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota, working a summer job at the Tribal Forestry Service. They called me Jake Little Elk, though some of my non-Lakota friends from school tried to shorten it to Jakey. They got the stink eye for their trouble. One sweltering July weekend, my supervisor asked me and a couple of the other older guys, all Lakota, to clear some brush near a remote stretch of land bordering the Badlands National Park. We loaded up an old pickup with chainsaws and axes and headed out, the dry air shimmering above the sun-baked prairie. We got to work, the buzz of the saws and the rhythmic thud of axes filling the morning silence. That's when I saw it, a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. Something big and dark was slinking just beyond the trees. It moved unnaturally low to the ground, its shape shifting and indistinct in the heat haze. The other guys were still focused on their work, oblivious. Unease prickled at the back of my neck. Now that I looked, I could see tracks in the dust near the tree lean, prints far too large for any dog or coyote. Hey, I said, lowering my axe. Y'all seen something move over there? The other two, Ben and Pete, looked over. Where? Ben asked. I pointed, but the tracks were the only thing visible. Guess it was nothing. My voice trailed off. I could feel it watching us, could feel the wrongness lurking in the shadows. We went back to work, but I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Every creak of branches in the wind made me jump. You're being paranoid, city boy, Pete joked, slapping me on the back. Maybe he was right. Still, I couldn't relax. Around lunchtime, Ben let out a startled curse. What the? He was pointing at one of the tires on the pickup. It was slashed open, the rubber hanging in ragged strips. Sabotage? 
A bear attack? Either way, we were stranded. Well, hell, Pete said, surveying the damage. Guess we're walking. Great. A long hike back to headquarters, under the burning sun, and in the presence of whatever lurked in the shadows. It was just past noon now, the sun climbing higher in the cloudless sky. We set off, me deliberately lagging behind. I kept glancing over my shoulder, expecting to see a pair of glowing eyes fixed on us. A couple of hours in, we came across the remains of a deer carcass, half-eaten, the exposed bones picked clean. The sight made my stomach churn. We walked faster, the silence broken only by the crunch of our boots on dry earth. Ben stopped abruptly. Look! He pointed to a set of faint footprints skirting the edge of the path. I froze. These were human-shaped, but way too big. Maybe it's a park ranger. Pete sounded desperate. My grandfather had told me stories long ago. Stories of things out there that weren't quite human, things to be feared. Could it be a, a skinwalker? My hands trembled. I thought of my grandfather, of his weathered face, of the warnings he'd given me. We gotta warn the others back at headquarters, I said urgently. About the truck, and something else is out here. Ben and Pete exchanged a worried look. You think it's... Ben trailed off, not wanting to say the word out loud. I nodded. I don't know for sure, but better safe than sorry, right? We pushed on, fear spurring us faster now. The sun was beginning to dip below the horizon when we saw the comforting sight of the Forestry Service headquarters. A handful of our co-workers were gathered out front. I felt a surge of relief. As we got closer, I realized something was wrong. They were all armed, their faces grim. What's going on? I asked, breathless. One of them, a guy named Tom, stepped forward. His eyes were bloodshot. There's been an accident, he said, his voice strained. Pete, your brother, he went out to fix a fence this morning. Never came back. A wave of nausea washed over me. Pete let out a strangled cry, the words I couldn't say tearing from his lips. The skinwalker. Tom looked at me, his eyes widening. You saw it too? The rest of the men fell silent, their eyes filled with a chilling mix of fear and resignation. We're going out at first light. Tom said, his voice now edged with steely determination. To find your brother. To find that, that thing. I didn't sleep that night. Instead, I cleaned my old hunting rifle, my hands steady and cold, every movement deliberate. Beside me, Ben tossed and turned, haunted by nightmares. His brother, my teammate, we might have to face the thing that killed him. At dawn, we gathered outside, myself, Ben, Tom, and four others, all of us hardened by life on the reservation, all of us now touched by a primal fear. We wore thick, heavy clothing, hoping it might offer some protection. I was loaded down with my rifle and enough supplies for a few days. This might not be a quick hunt. We followed the creature's oversized tracks. They led straight towards the Badlands, a stark, eroded landscape of cliffs and ravines, a perfect hiding place for something that wanted to disappear. Hours turned into a full day of relentless tracking. The trail twisted through dry ravines and up crumbling slopes. We found nothing but the occasional half-eaten rabbit carcass. The sun beat down, my sweat mingling with the ever-present dust. Maybe it's gone, Ben whispered, more in hope than conviction. I shook my head. The air hung heavy, the silence unnatural. Whatever it was, it knew we were coming, and it was waiting for us. Just before sunset, the tracks led to a narrow, shadowy gorge. The others hesitated, 
sensing the danger. Pete never made it out of here, Ben said, his voice low and strained. We don't have to. I looked at him, saw the grief and terror in his eyes. We could go back, report a missing person, let the police handle it. But deep down, we all knew they'd find nothing but questions, just like with the others who disappeared in these parts over the years. This was on us. Pete would come for me, I said, my voice surprisingly steady. We owe him this. Tom nodded grimly. We go in together, and we go in armed. We edged into the gorge, rifles raised. The shadows pressed in, the silence broken only by the rasp of our breath. I scanned the rock faces, expecting an ambush at any moment. The tracks vanished halfway down the gorge. Then, a noise like rocks tumbling. We froze, then whirled towards the sound. Above us, on the rim of the gorge, stood a figure, tall, hunched, its features hidden in the gathering dusk. Pete? Ben cried out in desperate hope. The figure turned. No, not Pete. It was something, unnatural. Its skin was taut against its bones, its face twisted into a hideous parody of a human. But its eyes, they burned with a cold, malevolent intelligence that made my blood run cold. Naga! I gasped. My grandfather's stories. The name surfaced like a half-forgotten nightmare. A spirit eater, a devourer of souls. The others exchanged terrified glances. It was one thing to hear the old tales, another to face the monstrous reality. The creature let out a piercing shriek, a sound that echoed through the gorge and seemed to tear at my sanity. It crouched, preparing to spring. Then, a flash of fur, a streak of brown launching at the naga from above. A mountain lion! It sunk its teeth into the naga's shoulder. The naga howled, thrashing. It tried to grab the cat, but the mountain lion was too quick, darting out of reach. We didn't hesitate. We fired. The gorge erupted with gunfire. The Naga screamed again, not in triumph, but in pain and rage. It stumbled, then turned and fled, scrabbling up the canyon wall with unnatural agility. The mountain lion, wounded but alive, bounded to safety. It watched the fleeing Naga, let out a low growl, and then disappeared. It saved us, I whispered, disbelief welling up. Tom shook his head. No. It was protecting its territory. Silence settled over the gorge. We finally emerged from the deepening shadows. I thought of Pete's mangled body, of the other vanished ones, and knew there would be no happy ending to this. Still, we'd done something. We hadn't turned away. We hadn't been devoured. Back at headquarters, we made a report. Missing person, possible wild animal attack. Nobody would believe the truth, and maybe that was for the best. Some truths are meant for the shadows. In the years that followed, I went away to college, got a job off the reservation. But something changed in me that day. When I look into the darkness now, I see the Naga's burning eyes, I smell the stink of death, I feel the echo of that chilling shriek. The old stories, the things that walk in the shadows, they're not just tales told to scare children. There are creatures that lurk on the edge of our world, and sometimes they cross the line. Maybe Pete is out there in the Badlands, his soul lost to the Spirit Eater. Maybe Ben is right, and it's better not to know not to see too deeply into the darkness. Maybe. But I'll keep my rifle loaded and my eyes wide open, just in case. Because the fight in that desolate gorge wasn't the end. I have this terrible feeling. It was just the beginning.
The year was 1995, and I'd found myself chasing wildfire smoke on the edges of Yosemite National Park. Been a firefighter for as long as I can remember, just like my father and his father before him. My name's Cameron Littlewolf, Crow Nation on my mother's side. I spent most of my life back home on the reservation, but the fire, it gets in your blood, calls you to where it burns hottest. A bad year for fires that one, dry winter, early spring heat, and a whole lot of forests ready to go up like tinder. We'd been battling that blaze for weeks, setting containment lines, beating back flames, and watching that old California wilderness smolder and smoke. It was on one of those exhausting treks through the burned scar that things took a turn for the worse. My crew, a tough bunch of hotshots, men and women who'd rather face down a hundred-foot wall of flame than spend a day at a desk, got separated during a terrain shift. The ground gave way beneath two of our guys, and they tumbled further down the slope. We managed to get them back up but by then the fire had changed direction, cutting off our path back to camp. With the radio spitting out static and those shifting winds, we were blind and on our own. Our crew leader, a grizzled veteran named Hank, made the call. We needed to find defensible ground and hunker down till backup arrived or the fire died back. We pushed deeper into the charred landscape following a deer trail that wound its way towards a high ridge. It was slow going, the air thick with ash and the heat brutal, even with the worst of the flames a distance behind us. One of our crew, a kid named Joey barely out of his teens, started to falter. Heat exhaustion was kicking in. Damned Greenhorn should have known better than to chug all his water in the first hour. By the time we reached the ridge, the kid was in bad shape. Hank made the tough call to split the crew. He and another hotshot, Beth, would stay with Joey in radio for a chopper evac. Me and the other two remaining crew members, Martinez and Sarah, would scout ahead for a safe place to hole up. The terrain on the far side of the ridge was a mess. Boulders tumbled down from the steep slopes. Half-burned trees stood stark against the sky, and the ground was littered with the kind of debris that turns into ankle-twisting nightmares. We stumbled on, doing our best to navigate that treacherous path. Then Martinez caught sight of it, a cave mouth, half-obscured by scrub brush and fallen branches. It wasn't much, but it looked stable, and offered more protection than huddling under a burned-out pine. We signaled back to Hank, giving him the new coordinates, and then made our way towards the cave, half-dragging Joey between us. As we got closer, a flicker of unease settled in me. Something didn't feel right, a prickling at the back of my neck. I shrugged it off at first, being lost behind enemy lines will do that to you. But the closer we got to that cave, the stronger the feeling grew. Maybe it was the silence, that unnatural stillness that descends on a fire-ravaged place. Or maybe it was something else that old hunter's instinct that's kept me alive all these years. We reached the mouth of the cave, and I hesitated. It felt wrong. The air hung heavy and still, tinged with an acrid, metallic scent I couldn't place. I shared a look with Martinez and Sarah seeing both my own unease and a touch of desperation reflected back at me. Joey was slumped against Martinez, barely conscious, and we needed shelter fast. We wait out here, we're dead, Sarah said, her voice grim. She was right. Whatever that cave held couldn't be worse than getting caught in another firestorm. I nodded and motioned for them to help Joey inside. We maneuvered him into the narrow entrance and laid him down on the cool dirt floor. I grabbed a flashlight and cautiously stepped further into the darkness. The cave wasn't deep, just a single chamber, the walls slick and damp. 
something glinted at the far end, catching the dim beam of my light. As I moved closer, the feeling of unease ratcheted up to outright dread. The source of the glint wasn't some natural mineral deposit, but piles and piles of bones. Animal bones, mostly, deer and coyote, maybe even mountain lion. But something about them was off. The skulls were cracked open, marrow sucked out. The long bones bore deep gnaw marks, as if some monstrous beast had feasted here. My blood ran cold. This wasn't a natural predator's den. This was something different, something unnatural. And the smell, it intensified, that strange mix of copper and rot. My ancestors' tales, the legends passed down on the reservation, flickered through my mind, stories of ravenous creatures that walked the line between man and beast, fueled by hunger and darkness. We gotta get out of here. I whispered to Martinez and Sarah, who had joined me at the back of the cave. They shared a look, part confusion, part dawning fear. Something's using this place, I said, keeping my voice low. It could be back any minute. We turned back toward the entrance, toward the fading light and the promise of safety, however distant. And then, from the tunnel leading further into the mountain, we heard it. A low growl, echoing off the rock walls. It sounded massive, like nothing human. Joey, who moments ago was barely conscious, let out a whimper and stirred. The sound echoed again, closer this time, followed by the rustling of something moving over stone. Go! I hissed, pushing the others towards the exit. Martinez went first, Sarah on his heels, then me. Bringing up the rear, my flashlight sweeping the passage behind us. When the creature emerged from the darkness, it was worse than anything my nightmares could have conjured. It was tall, at least seven feet at the shoulder, moving on four clawed limbs that were far too long. Its body was lean and emaciated, ribs visible beneath taut, hairless skin. But what chilled my soul was its head— a wolf's skull stretched and warped into a monstrous parody, rows of jagged teeth dripping with saliva. In the dim glow of my flashlight, I saw its eyes, gleaming red orbs fueled by pure predatory malice. Fear fueled us a primal force propelling us towards the fading light of the cave entrance. The monster was gaining, its growls reverberating through the tunnel. Joey, roused from his heat-induced stupor by pure terror, screamed. The creature let out a roar in response, the sound shaking the very rock around us. I shoved Joey towards the exit, knowing he was our weakest link. Martinez and Sarah were right behind him. I risked a glance back. The creature was lunging forward, its red eyes blazing, a blur of sinew and bones surging towards us. Despair washed over me. At this pace, we'd never make it. It would pick us off one by one. Split up! I yelled, my voice ragged. Make for the trees! It was a desperate gamble, but it might buy some of us precious seconds. Martinez veered left, disappearing behind a tangle of scorched branches. Sarah dodged right scrambling up a pile of loose rocks. It hesitated, its head swiveling between the fleeing targets, a guttural snarl of frustration tearing from its throat. That hesitation was my chance. I broke towards the cave entrance, drawing its attention. It roared again and bounded after me. I heard a scream cut short as the creature reached Sarah. Poor girl never had a chance. I stumbled out of the cave into the blinding light, nearly tripping over fallen rocks in my haste. Behind me, the creature snarled, momentarily disoriented by the sudden brightness. I didn't wait to see if it would adjust. I scrambled to my feet and sprinted for the tree line. Its clawed feet pounded the earth behind me, each echoing thud urging me to run faster. 
burning pain flared in my lungs, and my legs throbbed with the strain of exertion. I had a head start, but it wouldn't be enough. It was far too fast. Just when I thought my legs would give out, when the creature's hot, fetid breath seemed to sear the back of my neck, I reached the trees. I dodged behind the massive trunk of a half-burned pine, forcing the creature to slow down and maneuver. I used the respite to put more distance between us, zigzagging through the charred forest. I could hear it crashing through the underbrush, snapping branches and growling in rage, but with each desperate scramble, I gained a few more precious feet. Up ahead I saw it, the fireline, a wide swathe of dirt cut through the trees to slow the blaze's progress. Safety, or so I hoped. With a final, desperate surge of adrenaline, I burst out of the tree cover and onto the fireline. Behind me, the creature hesitated at the edge of the trees. A flicker of something like cunning crossed its warped canine face. For a heart-stopping moment, I thought it would back down, unwilling to brave the open ground. But then, it snarled, lowered its head, and charged. I sprinted down the fire line, lungs screaming, the monster a blur of motion at my back. Hank and the others had to be close, they had to hear the commotion, but was it too late? My foot caught on an exposed tree root, sending me sprawling to the ground. Pain shot up my leg as I tumbled. I rolled over, scrabbling to my feet just as the creature reached me. It lunged, teeth flashing, a whirlwind of claws and rage. I instinctively threw up an arm to shield my face. The impact knocked me backwards. I felt its claws rake my arm, searing pain lancing through the limb. I cried out, falling to the ground again and kicking wildly at the monstrous form. I caught a glimpse of my blood spattering the dirt, and then the creature reared back, distracted. Gunshots rang out, sharp and sudden, echoing through the smoky air. The creature flinched, a surprised snarl rumbling in its throat. I scrambled away, my vision blurring as more shots split the air. I heard a howl of pain, and then the pounding of its clawed feet retreating back into the trees. Hank, Beth, and a crew of fresh firefighters appeared at the edge of the tree line, rifles raised. The relief that flooded me was overwhelming. For a moment, I couldn't speak, couldn't move. I just blinked back tears and sagged against the ground, my wounded arm throbbing. When they reached me, it was a blur of concerned faces, shouted questions, and rough hands checking me for injuries. My arm was bad, the sleeve of my fire gear torn and bloody, but I wasn't dead. I was alive. In the aftermath, the questions came from the fire crew, the paramedics, later the investigators. I told them what I saw, every horrifying detail. They exchanged skeptical looks, muttered about trauma and hallucinations. I knew how it sounded. But I also knew what I faced in that cave, what stalked us through the charred remains of the forest. Some part of my rational mind insisted it couldn't be real, that the exhaustion and the horror of the fire played tricks on my perception. But a deeper, more primal part of me, the part tied to my ancestors and the old stories, recognized the truth. The creature, the legends called it a gray wolf, twisted spirits of greed and rage given monstrous form. It's hard to fight old whispers when they're clawing at your insides. The rest of the crew found Sarah's remains, not much left but bones picked clean. Joey never did recover fully from the heat stroke, left the fire service not long after. And that cave, the one with the bones, that section of the burned scar got marked closed, deemed too unstable for exploration. Maybe they figured some mountain lion moved in, maybe something worse. I never said a word. But sometimes I wonder if they saw a flicker of those glowing red eyes in the shadows too. 
I spent weeks in the hospital, then months in rehab. My arm healed, leaving behind angry scars that ache on damp days. But deeper scars linger in my mind. The nightmares come less often now, the image of that warped wolf snout and those terrible eyes fading just a little over time. But the fire service. I couldn't go back. Not after that. Life took its own odd turns. I ended up on the reservation, taking some odd jobs, helping the elders. Found a sort of peace I never expected. Most folks don't believe my story, and that's probably for the best. But on those nights when the wind howls around the old shack I call home, and the shadows seem just a little too long, a little too sharp, well, let's just say I sleep with a hunting rifle close by, a gift from my great-grandfather. Sometimes the old ways are the only ways, when darkness wears the skin of a wolf. I stepped off the Greyhound in the summer of 1982 into the muggy Louisiana air. Bobby spotted elk, I said to the cab driver the moment his door swung open. I tossed my bag in the back and climbed in, shutting the door behind me. The cab rumbled away from the station. Everything seemed wrong from the start. Nothing moved the way things were meant to. I've spent most of my life on the reservation in Montana. The wide open spaces were part of me. Here the trees pressed close, the Spanish moss hanging from them like ragged soles. The humidity wrapped around me like a wet blanket, smothering and oppressive. The cab pulled to a stop. I paid the driver and shouldered my bag, pausing at the foot of the stairs. The boarding house sat crooked and worn in desperate need of love and a good coat of paint. The flickering neon sign buzzed intermittently. It was the only clue left to find my grandmother. I'd been fifteen when she'd vanished. My aunt had called me out of class, her voice sharp with barely concealed grief. Your gram is missing. The police haven't turned up anything yet. That had been eight years ago. I stepped across the threadbare rug in the entry. The bell above the door jangled discordantly. Mrs. Duvall sat behind the counter, engrossed in a dog-eared romance novel. She glanced up, surprise flashing across her face. Bobby spotted Elk? Your aunt called, said to expect you. Room seven's free. She pushed a tarnished brass key across the counter toward me. I felt a flare of resentment. My aunt couldn't even be bothered to come herself. The stairs creaked ominously beneath my feet. I found room seven, the paint peeling on the door. I let myself in. Musty air hung heavy in the cramped space. Faded curtains shrouded a single window overlooking the alley below. I dumped my bag on the sagging mattress and headed out to find something to eat. The streets were quiet, the heat pushing people indoors. A lone hound dog lay sprawled in a patch of shade on a porch, tongue lolling as it watched me pass. I turned down a side street and found a diner with a faded, chipped sign declaring the establishment Millie's. The air conditioner blasting frigid air was a welcome surprise after the sweltering heat. I slipped into a booth at the back of the diner grateful for the empty space. A harried-looking waitress bounced over, pencil poised. Han, what can I get you? Coffee. Black, I said, glancing at the menu out of habit. I already knew I wouldn't be eating, the greasy diner smell churning my stomach. The coffee was watery and bitter, not that it mattered. All this was a means to an end. My grandmother had left in the middle of the night, her jewelry and most of her money left behind, but she'd taken the deed to the house. It was the house my parents had died in, leaving me and my grand to hold the crumbling pieces of our family together. 
The old house wasn't much, a ramshackle thing a little too close to the swamp, but Graham had refused to sell. Stubborn old woman. When I turned eighteen, I left, joining the army to put space between me and the ache that always lingered below the surface. Now my three-year hitch was up, and a letter had arrived a week before I was discharged, a lawyer down here handling my grandmother's estate. She must be dead. I didn't kid myself for a moment that she'd walked out and found a new life somewhere. At sixty-five, with barely a pot to piss in, there weren't a lot of options. The waitress returned and plunked a chipped, faded blue mug in front of me, refilling my cup. I took a sip, gritting my teeth against the scalding liquid. Not from around here, are you? The waitress asked, leaning against the table, a strand of blonde hair escaping from her hairnet. I took a breath, forcing something akin to a smile. I'd have to get used to the small talk if I was sticking around. No, Montana. Her eyes lit up. That's wild Indian territory, right? Right. I said flatly and took another sip, hoping she'd get the hint and leave me alone. No such luck. What's it like? You ever had one of those vision quests? I blinked, thrown by the unexpected question. Ah, uh, no. I had to get out of here before I gave in to the urge to dump hot coffee over her bigoted head. Look, I need to be going. I slapped a five on the table and stood up. As I hit the street again, a pricking unease settled between my shoulder blades. People lingered in the doorways, their gazes a little too keen, a little too sharp as I passed. The boarding house loomed ahead of me. Something felt wrong, but I couldn't put my finger on it. It was like everyone waiting for something to happen. I trudged up the stairs to my room, kicking off my boots and staring at the lumpy mattress. The urge to go back downstairs and demand my aunt's number from Mrs. Duvall was strong. I needed to talk to someone who knew more about what was going on than I did. A sharp knock at the door interrupted my thoughts. I opened it to find a young cop, his face barely out of boyhood. Mr. Spotted Elk? Yeah. He shifted his weight nervously. They found a body. Fits your grandmother's description. I, uh, need you to come down to the station for an ID. His voice squeaked on the last word. My breath caught in my throat, a cold fist closing in my chest. Finally... After all these years, some closure. An end to wondering. I grabbed my boots and followed him out. The police station buzzed with small-town energy, the sense of something important happening. A grizzled officer ushered me down a narrow hallway and into a cramped, windowless room. She slid across a blurry Polaroid. My grandmother's face stared back at me. It wasn't right. It was her, but not. Her face was etched with fear, her eyes wide with terror. And there, on her throat, four deep, ragged punctures. My stomach clenched. What the hell had happened to her? We found her at the old Lebeau place, the officer said. My head jerked up, an old memory stirring. Why would she go there? It has a bad reputation. Abandoned and overgrown, the old Lebeau house was nothing more than a derelict wreck, a place where the local kids would dare each other to go when they were drunk and feeling bold. The officer shrugged. Don't know. Maybe thought there might be something valuable there, worth selling. He sounded dismissive. Do you recognize her? Yes, that's my grandmother. My voice was thick. She deserved better than this, than being found dead and half-eaten in some spooky old abandoned house. After a few more questions verifying the ID, they released me out into the thick, humid night. I walked slowly, the weight of the last few hours bearing down on me. It didn't make sense. 
she died out there at the Lebeau place. Someone, or something, had killed her. A wave of anger washed over me, replacing the numbness. I had to find out what happened. Back at the boarding house, I grabbed my boots and pulled them on, my mind running a mile a minute. It was foolish, but I had to go back there, had to see the place for myself. There might be something there, something the police overlooked. It took me twenty minutes to walk the winding road to the edge of the swamp. The Lebeau place came into view, rising above the overgrown reeds, a sinister silhouette against the moonlit sky. As I got closer, the stench of rot hung thick in the air. My stomach turned. I pulled my shirt up over my nose and forced myself forward. The front door was gone, rotted wood littering the porch. I pulled out my flashlight, the beam cutting a swath through the dusty darkness. The floorboards creaked and sagged with my weight. I could imagine my grandmother walking carefully, searching the broken-down rooms, hope flickering in her eyes, and then the terror as realization dawned. I reached the back room where I knew they'd found her. The smell was stronger here, overpowering. I steeled myself and forced open the door. The beam of light cut through the gloom, landing on a pile of rags in the corner. My blood froze. The rags were soaked through with dark, dried blood. Scraps of tattered, flowered fabric lay scattered about, fabric that looked achingly familiar. I didn't want to approach, didn't want to confirm what I already knew in my bones, but I forced myself to walk closer. The flashlight shook in my hand. Something glinted. I bent down, pushing aside a scrap of cloth, and my grandmother's turquoise necklace winked up at me in the pale beam of light. It was broken in two, the other half nowhere in sight. My mind raced. My grandmother's jewelry was proof enough she'd been here, had met her end here. But what could have left marks like that? A wild animal? But even a bear or wolf couldn't leave wounds this precise, this intentional. A sense of wrongness settled over me. There was something more going on here. I had to get out of there, go back to town, but first. I took photos, the room, the pile of blood-soaked fabric, my grandmother's necklace. I needed evidence, even if it was thin. Then, forcing back the nausea, I turned and walked quickly, purposefully through the shattered house, back to the road. The moon hung low, the air buzzing with crickets. When I reached the boarding house, I stumbled into my room, locking it behind me. I paced, my thoughts circling. The local lore flooded back to me, tales we told as kids around the reservation campfire to scare each other. Stories of shadowy figures haunting the swamps, creatures of legend. My pragmatic mind had dismissed them, of course, but now, doubt seeped in. If the Lebeau house truly was haunted, as the rumors claimed, then perhaps there was more to my grandmother's death than just an animal attack. But those kinds of things didn't actually exist, did they? The logical part of me rebelled against the very notion but the raw fear in her eyes in that photo wouldn't leave me. The punctures on her throat, perfectly spaced, those weren't the work of any creature I knew. Exhaustion pulled me under like a riptide. I collapsed on the bed, still dressed. The next morning, the sun streamed through the worn curtains. My head throbbed, and a knot of fear sat in my chest. I had slept fitfully, dreams of clawing hands and gleaming eyes chasing me through the swamp. I splashed cold water on my face, forcing myself to focus. I had to talk to someone who might know more about the local folklore. Maybe there was another explanation, something I hadn't considered. On my way out, Mrs. Duvall stopped me, concern creasing her worn face. You ain't slept a wink, child. I heard you up most of the night. 
It's nothing. I pushed past her. If she knew what I was poking into, she'd shut up faster than a clam. The diner was my best bet. Busybodies thrived in a place like Millie's. The waitress from yesterday, Jenny, perked up when she saw me. Back for more, huh? She slid into the booth across from me. Just coffee. Got an early start. I lied. What brings you back down to these parts? She asked, refilling my cup. My grandmother. I came down for her things. Maybe I could steer the conversation in the right direction. Jenny's smile faltered. That's awful what happened. You knew her? I asked, trying to sound casual. Sure. She came in here from time to time, Jenny said, twisting a strand of hair around her finger. Sweet older lady. Folks say that old Lebeau place is cursed. Her gaze flicked to the window, a shadow crossing her face. Bingo. Cursed how? I prompted. She lowered her voice, looking around like she was afraid of being overheard. They say there's something living in that swamp. Something not right. Not right? Fear prickled down my spine. Well, tell you the truth, no one really knows. Stories get passed down, get mixed up and overblown with the years. Some folks say there's a, a monster, some kind of creature out there. I felt my heart thudding. It was crazy. And yet, it lined up with the photo, the wounds. What kind of creature? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. She shrugged, her discomfort clear. I don't rightly know. Ain't something you see clear as day, if you get my meaning. Of course. It was just stories, legends spun on long swampy nights. I had to get a grip. Thanks, I said, downing the last of the bitter coffee and leaving a few crumpled bills on the table. It was time to do some research. If there was even a shred of truth to the old stories, I needed to find out what I was up against. My grandmother's life depended on it. No, it was too late for her. But I'd be damned if I let whatever did this get away with it. Vengeance burned in me. The old town library smelled of dust and old paper. I settled into a back corner and began searching through the local history archives. There were stories, plenty of them, tales of strange disappearances, livestock found mutilated, sightings of a shadowy figure. It was all vague, fragmented, but the thread connecting it all was the swamp beyond the Lebeau place. One account, tucked away in a crumbling book of bayou folklore, made my blood run cold. It described a creature, hunched and feral, the river they called it. A shapeshifter, half-man, half-beast, with razor-sharp teeth. Stories of something like this stretched back for over a century, always circling the edges of the swamp. I knew, bone-deep, that this was what I was dealing with. My pragmatic mind still fought against it, but fear battled back with images of my grandmother's terror-filled eyes and the brutal puncture marks in her photo. There was nothing else it could be. It was late afternoon when I emerged from the library, a plan taking shape in my mind. The sun would set soon, and with night would come the creature. I went back to the boarding house and dug into my duffel bag. Beneath my spare clothes lay my old hunting rifle, rarely used except for target practice back on the reservation. I checked the action, loaded it with silver bullets. Werewolves were the stuff of horror movies, but silver hurt most things that didn't belong in this world. Night settled in. Instead of my room, I went to the roof of the boarding house. From there, I had a clear view of the road twisting out to the swamp. I sat, rifle across my lap, and waited. Hours slipped by, the silence broken only by the rustle of leaves and distant croak of frogs. 
doubt not at me. Was I chasing shadows, fueled by grief and half-remembered stories? Then, a noise, a snap of a twig far below. I tensed, every nerve on high alert. A shadow moved at the edge of the road. My heart slammed in my chest. It shambled into the weak moonlight, a hunched figure with glowing, yellow eyes. It paused, sniffing the air, and then turned its head to look straight at me. That was my chance. I raised the rifle, steadied my aim, and fired. Three shots rang through the night. There was a guttural howl, the sound of something large crashing through the underbrush. I waited, barely breathing. Had I hit it? Wounded it? There was no sign of the creature. I sat for a long time, until the first fingers of dawn reached across the sky. If I'd wounded it, it'd retreat back to the depths of the swamp, at least for a while. And even if I hadn't, the noise would scare it away from town. It had cost my grandmother her life, but at least I'd prevented any more deaths. For now. I walked back to my room, body heavy, dawn washing the sky in shades of pale pink. The logical part of me wanted to laugh at myself, chalk this up to sleeplessness and old superstitions. But I knew that wasn't possible anymore. The world was a bit bigger, a bit wilder, than I'd ever believed. And there were things lurking in that wildness, things I wouldn't forget.